Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another week's Late Heat. And Kevin, we're in WrestleMania season officially. We yeah. saw WWE turn up the dials on their WrestleMania hype this week on Raw. We saw SmackDown. Roman Reigns is here. They did a Cody face-off. That's happening in WWE. AW had Revolution, which we'll get to. Some big stuff happened on that show, specifically a damn good Iron Man match, perhaps the best ever. But Kevin, the real crux of the show today is all about WrestleMania and the all-time great versions of the show, 17 and 19. So, so much to get to. Kevin, I'll throw it to you, pal. How you doing? Talk to us. I'm fantastic, pal. Yeah, I can't wait to debate. I guess debate WrestleMania 17 versus 19. I would say this is more of like a, um, like a, just a general praise for how good both of those shows were. Like, like there's really no right or wrong answer if you think WrestleMania 17 is better than 19. If you think 19 is better than 17, that's great. You're debating apples and oranges. You're debating the greatest, the absolute best of what WrestleMania is, it can be, and was with those two shows. It's like pulling hairs, you know, but nevertheless, um, yeah, so much happened. SmackDown, we can talk about that briefly. But what did you think of the Roman Reigns and Cody segment slash stare down slash promo? Personally, okay, I really want your take on this, which we'll get to in a moment, because sometimes with these Roman Reigns segments, I feel like, am I biased? Because when I watched that, I thought Roman Reigns, he just showed why he is the guy, like why he is the, the big boss of WWE. The way he did the dusty impression, the way he executed his promo, it just, you're watching going, he is just better than Cody Rhodes. And it makes the story fitting that Cody Rhodes is the underdog. He's battling to overcome Roman. It, it made you really feel like, okay, Cody Rhodes has to, you know, pull out all the stops and do everything he can just to beat Roman. Like that segment, I thought it was excellent. I thought it was a fantastic, entertaining segment. I love Reigns throwing the belts down on the ground. I love Reigns kicking out the bloodline and being like, I don't care. I don't need them to beat you, Cody. Like, you, I mean, you're Cody Rhodes. So like, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. what can I say? Like, I thought it was great. So, Kevin, am I a bit biased for saying Reigns cleared Cody in that segment? What do you think of it? You know, it's funny. You mentioned Cody being the underdog. And do you want to hear the current betting odds? Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes from WrestleMania 39, according to Vegas. I'd love to. What are the odds? Roman Reigns is a clear underdog at plus 225. Cody Rose is an overwhelming favorite at minus 350. You know, that surprises me. That me does too. surprise me. Me too. Wow. I thought it'd be a little bit closer than that. I thought it'd be more like close to a pick em. Damn. I know, right? Wow. Yeah, that is kind of shocking. But yeah, I mean, yeah, Cody is being presented as the underdog on TV, and I think it makes sense. He is the baby face. For the most part of his career, he's been a mid-card guy. Even in AEW, he was the mid-card guy. And now he's here. He's in the the face of the big dog. And here we are. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, but to answer your question about the segment... I watched it and I was kind of like, wow, this is, yeah, it, it shows the gap, the skill gap between Roman Reigns and just about everybody else. Because Cody Rhodes, for all intents and purposes, is the best thing that WWE has to offer and has had to offer in terms of a good foil, a good, <clears throat> a good competition for Roman Reigns. Cody Rhodes, this version of Cody Rhodes, is the most credible, the best challenger for Roman's championship reign. Yeah, you can say Cena is a bigger star, you know, whatever. At SummerSlam 2021, it was a bigger match. But we all knew Cena was going to lose. Cena's going to go back to Hollywood, keep filming movies, doing commercials. But Cody is like a true full-time babyface star, unlike anyone that we've seen challenge Roman Reigns. Right or wrong? Oh, 100% agree. And I was thinking about this as well. Kevin, this is the biggest... WWE, like, full-time star versus full-time star WrestleMania main events. Like, I was trying to think, like, when? Because we've had matches where it's Roman Reigns versus, you know, part-time legend X or, you know, 
like, like I was, I was thinking about this like the other day, and you know, is it since 2014 with Brian Batista and Orton? <laughs> like, when was the last time a babyface full time star versus a heel? We'll still say Reigns is full time ish, you know, like a, a match with two current guys who aren't like proper proper part timers is a main event that you're genuinely really interested in. I can't think of the last time that would actually happen. If you're talking like a legitimate one-on-one match, now yeah. th- this match didn't have the same amount of interest, but WrestleMania 27 had full-time heel Miz and full-time babyface Cena. Yeah. That's that was, what, 12, 12 years, years ago. ago? Yeah. Wow. Like, okay, like, I was thinking about that, yeah, because like, you go through the WrestleMania main events in the last decade, and it's just a lot of, yeah, Roman Reigns versus Undertaker, Reigns versus Triple H, Reigns versus Brock, Reigns versus Brock, Reigns versus Brock. Like, you know, <laughs> just a lot of that. And yeah, this, Cena, and then even before that, it was Cena Rock for two years in a row. Yeah. And, you know, before that, like, I mean, I just what Triple H and Randy Orton, maybe in 25, because uh, 26, I mean, Michael's Undertaker were sort of, I mean, uh, maybe them, but. You get the point. It's been over a decade, really, since we've had a match like this, which I think is pretty cool because usually it's not like this. So th- that's a big tip to the cap to WWE for actually having a compelling full-time babyface star and then a compelling top heel. That's a big tick for WWE, in my honest opinion, Kevin. Absolutely. Hi, right, pal. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about Revolution, AEW's big spring pay-per-view. The show was headlined by Brian Danielson versus MJF, which we'll talk about. But yeah, just overall, for me, I watched the whole show. You only saw the main event, right? Uh, yeah, I, I saw like highlights and little bits of the other stuff, and I watched the main event near enough in its entirety. So that, that, that was my consumption. You watched basically the whole thing. Kevin, what were your thoughts? Did you like the show? Just give us a general opinion. Yeah, I watched the whole thing aside from the the pre-show match. Just wasn't really intrigued in that. There's a lot of things that I'm not going to touch involving the pre-show match and Mark Briscoe and promotional tactics that we've seen. (coughs) Nevertheless, moving on. But overall, I I thought the entire show, top to bottom, was really good. And I I think it's in the front runner for AEW's best pay-per-view ever. And this was, what, the fourth edition of Revolution? We're looking at the fifth edition of Double or Nothing coming on pretty soon. So yep. we've been around for about five years now with AEW pay-per-views. And this one just delivered in a way that I was not expecting. I think that was part of it. The build was kind of lackluster. But mm-hmm. there was so much to like about this show. I mean, this was like, this was the showcase for the young stars. Hangman Page beat Moxley. The House of Black beat the Elite. Jungle Boy beat Christian. Ricky Starks beat Jericho. Hangman beat Moxley. I think I said that already. Wardlow beat Samoa <laughs> Joe. Yeah. MJF beat Brian Danielson. All across the card is young talent going over, but which is just something that I think was necessary. I mean, the, the name of the show is Revolution. It's about change. It's about fresh and doing things differently, which is what we saw. I was pleasantly surprised by the opening match. I, I thought that was Chris Jericho's best non-gimmicky match, non-hardcore match, non-ladder match, whatever that he's had. So that's a credit to Ricky Starks for being able to help uh, carry it along Chris Jericho at this stage of his career to a good match. But really what I want to focus on, and it is the most controversial match the entire night, and that's Hangman Page versus John Moxley. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. But I watched the match. I thought it was good. Um... A lot of people on the internet thought it was too much blood. And I think a lot of people do that just for attention, for yeah. interaction, for debate. I thought it was good. Overall, what, what do you think? How do you feel about this, like, this style of wrestling that we've seen from John Moxley? This Texas death match or the hardcore lights out match, that, that style of match that Moxley's been famous for since he went to AEW? Uh, that style isn't for me personally but it doesn't mean i hate it right like i I watched bits of this i was seeing clips yeah, obviously there's obviously gonna be blood duh that's not surprising <laughs> but you know some of the use of weapons and like <laughs> weapons is a bit of a stretch for some of the things they use but yeah I, I wasn't like one of the people online who was 
freaking out about this, acting as though it was like the worst garbage wrestling match we've seen. Like, it's not for everyone. And that's the, that's this style. I mean, I remember watching the um, Lights Out match with Moxley and Omega back at Full Gear 19, so the first year of AEW. And I was like, this isn't for me, but I still enjoy it. And that's how I felt with this match from what I've seen. Like, it, it wasn't a match which I'm going to desperately go back to rewatch just because that style I don't particularly enjoy. But it was on the night and for a, a pay-per-view match, I mean, Hangman went over. I thought it came off decently like i mean ken what do you think what do you think i thought it was really good i mean people have been wanting a more adult oriented style of wrestling and then now AEW is giving it to them and people are upset that's a little bit confusing to me people want blood they want violence but then they get it and they're upset so I'm, I'm a little confused about that but nevertheless yeah the match was good there was nothing wrong with it i thought yeah you could maybe some people might cringe at like Moxley using a screwdriver or whatever it was. I forgot what it was that he was like digging in Angman's fork. Oh, he's using a fork, pal. Fork, yeah. Crossing the line, pal. Yeah, I thought it was good. I, I thought it was a good match. Like, it was maybe Hangman's best match. And, and a lot, one thing with Hangman is that he's pretty good at when he has an opponent, he's pretty good at wrestling up to that credible opponent style with, or stardom. When it's Moxley, when it's Punk, he's pretty good. I hope Hangman, he can use the momentum garnered from this win and kind of stand on his own and help get people to the next level that are not at his level. Yeah. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I mean, yeah. I, I thought the main event was fantastic. MJF versus Brian Danielson. Arguably the best 60-minute Iron Man match ever in any wrestling promotion. That was a hell of a lot more intriguing than the match that, um, that Sean and Brett had. WrestleMania, I mean, that match was kind of boring. Oh, easily, yeah. Yeah, and then there was, like, Kurt and Brock, which wasn't really an iron... Uh, technically 60 minutes, there was, like, 20 minutes of commercials in it. This was 65 minutes, unfiltered wrestling. No commercials, no breaks, nothing. But really, what everybody's talking about, though, is MJF for his heel tactics, pal. And, and oh, I, know, I know you're familiar with what I'm talking about. MJF yep. threw tequila. Allegedly threw tequila in a, in a child's face. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just say for me, if that was unplanned, like if nobody told me, hey, this is, this is going to happen, and some wrestler walks up and throws liquor in my kid's face, I, I don't know how I would handle that. I thought the mom handled it pretty well. I mean, I, I, this is the thing. One of these days, what I'm trying to say is one of these days, if MJF keeps doing this shit, it's going to get ugly. And then it's going to be the, the person in the crowd. It's going to be the fans' fault, putting their hands on a wrestler. So one day, somebody's going to punch MJF in the face. MJF's going to retaliate, beat that person's ass. And it's going to be the fans' fault when it shouldn't be. So, I mean, it, like, I, don't, I was not a big fan of this. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, MJF should be canceled. AEW should be canceled. Tony Khan should be bankrupt because he allowed this to happen. Yeah. But it's an unplanned spot. Like, I don't well, know. Kevin... Kevin, I want your thoughts on something. I think you're probably best placed to answer this. Um, AW, and this, this has gone over social media um, in the aftermath of said incident, as you referred to. Um, AW have a fan code of conduct thing that like plays like a disclaimer like on the Titantron. Uh, and it reads, quote, if you have a seat on the floor, you are at risk of being struck by persons, objects, barricades, and other items. Please be aware of the action as you are watching and move out of the way if someone or something is coming your way. By staying in this area, you assume all risks of injury to yourself and your property. Now, that's a statement. That's what AEW put out pretty much at the start of each taping and each definitely pay-per-view. They did before um, Revolution. And I saw, I've seen a lot of debate over whether something like that would fly in court. Whether, like, for instance, in this situation, a wrestler gets tequila allegedly throws it in some kid's face let's say that kid goes blind that kid is, is now vision impaired hypothetically it, like in the mother wanted to sue does that aw statement stand up in court sort of thing i don't and think it does it, it's not it, it doesn't like yeah i get it they're like they're they're trying to cover bases but if something goes horribly wrong if like that kid all of a sudden has like you know it, it, maybe it's a skin issue and the alcohol thrown in his face gives him like a burning rash reaction and 
he has to go to the hospital. Like, you, you don't know with this stuff. It's really unpredictable and, you know, you play a lot of risks when you get involved in this sort of stuff. So, Kevin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, what, what, like I said earlier, one day he's going to do that to the wrong fan and it's going to be the fan's fault when the fan assaults him. He'd be like, oh my god, you went to a wrestling show, you should know better. Oh, um, it's not, it wasn't like they're in the middle of doing a move and, like, MJF, he accidentally flies over the barricade and knocks into you. That's different, okay? Like, that, that is covered under the statement. But a wrestler going into the crowd looking for problems, like he, MJF brought the problem to the child and to the mother. It wasn't like it was part of the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think that would be the can... argument in court. It would be obviously a lot more creative of an argument in court, but I don't think that, I don't, I don't think what AEW, their, their announcement, their disclaimer, I don't think that's going to hold up. I don't think it would hold up in the Yeah, no, I'd... I don't think it would either. But, Kevin, nonetheless, we, we won't just focus on that. There was a <laughs> phenomenal 65-minute main event Iron yes. Man match, which going into it, I will say this was, as, as I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll agree, this was like the only thing I was really interested in going into this show. Um, the rest of it was kind of just there. And as you said, you watched the whole thing. It delivered. It you know, over exceeded your expectations. But, yeah, this main event, I love the way they did this. I thought it was really good. Um, I was expecting what we usually see in Iron Man matches where for the most part, the first really like 45 minutes, it's almost a bit of a lull. That's what I was expecting. Um, but the way they did it was creative. It was a, There was a lot of thought that went into this clearly. I thought it was well booked, well executed. I liked MJF doing like the two for one. I thought that was brilliant. That was great. That, like, that was common sense. That was a bit of initiative. Um, the fact that they had pinfalls be able to be done like immediately after a pinfall i liked uh, some people didn't i thought that was good um because usually in iron man matches it gets annoying when there's a fall and there's like 30 seconds of the referee checking on everyone and it stops the match altogether. then they restart i liked how this had a flow to it i enjoyed that i thought the stuff you know late obviously kevin iron man matches the last couple of minutes last 10 minutes particularly really last few minutes Everything heats up. All the action kind of climaxes a bit. I thought this was really well done. So, yeah, all in all, hats off to AEW. This was a, a damn good main event. One of their best matches. To me, probably the most captivated I've been during AEW match in I don't know how long, um, which is a testament to the AEW, testament to MJF, Brian, everyone involved. So, yeah, round of applause. I don't really have a negative thing to say about this, which might surprise some. I really enjoyed it. So Yeah, it was certainly a star-making performance. For MJF. There were still some people that were kind of like, eh, I don't know how I feel about it. Curry was still kind of out. I think MJF kind of silenced all the doubters. And I think he increased his stock from 2024 when there's going to be a massive bidding war between AEW and WWE for his services. So, yeah. Yeah, shout out to him. I mean, he's in a contract year, pal. But MJF's probably going to turn in performances like this on a regular basis. But yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah. Uh, Brian Danielson is a perfect guy that can main event an AEW pay-per-view. AEW crowd loves him. He doesn't need to win. He doesn't need anything. He can lose every single match he's involved in in AEW, and it won't matter. He's already a made guy. He's already like a top 40 guy all time, so I'm not going to cry that he lost clean or semi-clean, whatever. Nevertheless, pal, you ready to talk about uh, Monday Night Raw? Yeah, um, yeah, speaking of made guys, Kevin, I want to talk about Cena. Um, to me, this was the big thing on Raw. Then, then now there were, Kevin, a number of things that did happen on Raw. WWE, they loaded this show up. Yeah. They put a lot of effort into this to try and really, not kickstart the WrestleMania build, but really get the did, hype. Uh, did Vincent Candy McMahon book this show, pal? Vincent Candy McMahon loaded up? Well, according to Twitter, Vince McMahon's had a say in shows every week. So I, I guess Vince had a say in this one by, by logic. He has a mustache, pal. Just like me, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I think this show is great. Um, one of the best roars in a long time. Now, that's not saying much because I've struggled to sit through any roar <laughs> really in the past five to ten years. Uh, this was really good though. Um, I sort of thought the show flowed well. They had a lot of interesting stuff involving storylines. Storylines progressed. Um, and to me, the big one was Cena Theory. Uh, for a long time, it was one of these matches where 
you, you hear it might happen, you hear rumors, you think it would make sense. But then you see WWE or just any wrestling company, you see WWE do it and you go, yes, <laughs> like this works. This is really good. Um, Cena was scathing. It, it was brutal. Yeah. Um, this was very much like the, the rain segment yeah. from about five, six years ago. Only this one, theory is not as good as Reigns. So it was even more scathing. At least in that one, Cena gave a bit more props to Reigns, saying like, you're good, but you just ain't that guy. Like that's what he told Reigns six years ago. This one was Cena literally saying, we don't care, Austin. You don't believe in yourself. So why should anyone hear? I have a bold spot, but they have to pipe in crowd noise because you suck. I'm going to beat you at WrestleMania. Oh, I'm going to challenge you to wrestlemania match i'm not accepting your challenge you don't deserve to challenge me you're a bum my god it was brutal i loved it it was phenomenal this was some of cena's best stuff this is cena being the guy who carried the french wrestling for 15 years as the big top star going bruh this is a guy who can't really get over in the mid card in 2023 wwe Get out of here. Miss me with this. Dean just buried him. It this is the amazing. equivalent if... Uh, I'll let you go in a second. I'm sorry. I just got to say this before I forget. No, I'm done. We'll this be. is the equivalent if John Cena made like a big return, let's say in 2015, and his opponent was Stardust. Like he was literally like, bro, you're, 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 you're Stardust, bro. Like, crash. <laughs> but what did Austin Theory do? Did Austin Theory sleep with Nikki Bella? <laughs> like what, what did he do so wrong to John Cena? This was bad. This was really bad. I, 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 don't, <coughs> I don't see how <coughs> this is going to help Austin Theory in the long run. I think it will. I think it will because this was, it was very, it was a real, it was a very real segment. It was seen literally going, as I, as I just said, saying all the things I just said and pointing out, we don't, people don't believe you. Make us believe Austin. Like make us care. It was him calling out reality. And I guess the whole storyline going to WrestleMania now is that Theory needs to prove himself against one of the all-time greats and prove himself to the audience, which is a logical, reasonable storyline. It's not them feuding over a bottle of shampoo or them (laughs) feuding over choppy, choppy, your pee-pee. It's a logical storyline. So I think it it was excellent. I think this was like watching this segment, Cena got a massive pop in Boston. He was Cena was getting emotional during the entrance. Like, like this was just great. This was, you know, this, when Cena comes out and does this sort of stuff, this is what we love to see, pal. This, I, thank you, Vince McMahon, for booking this segment, pal. Thank you, Vince. Uh, I'll stick with my with my theory that Austin Theory slept with Nikki Bella. Like a young Austin Theory had to sleep with Nikki Bella. Cena and her got engaged. There's no way. Like, why, why else was Cena bury Austin Theory like this? Cena had the golden shovel out, pal. Uh, Austin Theory was Wade Barrett in 2010. We went oh, back yeah. in time, pal. Yep. Another yeah. young talent, Cena, really helped get over, pal. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, Cena did... He did Theory just like how Jungle Boy did Christian Cage, pal. Literally buried him in a casket, pal. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Pal. Any other any other talking points from Raw? I mean, there a few things happened. There was the... Oh, actually, I want your thoughts on this, Kevin. The storyline, the greatest WWE storyline in years, yep. the bloodline, ended the show. Jey Uso finally turned on Sami Zayn. Kevin, you were scathing in the Elimination Chamber review. You said, this is the blow off of the greatest storyline in years? Really, bro? That was your quote for Baden. Kevin, after watching that Monday Night Raw ending, what are your thoughts, pal? This is the greatest, biggest storyline in years. What are your thoughts? Uh, we're, we're exactly where I knew we would be at, at, after the Elimination Chamber. Jey Uso is now mad at Sami Zayn because Sami Zayn accidentally hit him with a clothesline after Jim Uso got out of the way. And here we are. Jey Uso is mad at Sami, pal. Um, I mean, they're, they're doing a good job of adding more layers to it, but that's essentially what it is. And this is the greatest storyline in the history of pro wrestling. And it's featuring Jey Uso and Sami Zayn hugging Wow. Riveting. Riveting stuff, pal. Yeah. All right, pal. I think that's enough about current wrestling. Bit going wait, on. wait, 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 wait. I want to ask you real quick, because I didn't watch oh. Raw. I just want to ask you, did, did you see the Logan Paul and Seth Rollins segment? A, a little bit. A little bit. Logan Paul lays out Seth Rollins. He's using, he's, he's just, a, Kevin, to me, Logan's just a good heel. I mean, that was my only real takeaway <laughs> from the segment. <clears throat> yeah. Interesting. Okay. 
Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to spend more time on Jey Uso and Sammy. I thought you, um, you, would, you would be intrigued to talk about this, considering your uh, your passion for the storyline and how much you love it. Uh, th- this is the thing. I don't know. My passion. Is, I'm more passionate to the, the bloodline when it involves Reigns directly. If that makes sense. Hmm. Like th- this is to me an extension of the bloodline. It's like you, you harken back to the Attitude Era with the corporation. The stuff that involved Vince and Austin and that sort of stuff, that was what I care about most when I'm watching that stuff. And all the complementary parts of it, which in this case is the Usos, Sammy and KO, that's, you know, a complementary part of the story to me. Um, To me, Reigns is the head honcho, the big dog part of the story. And this other stuff, I'm interested. I'm not saying I'm not for a second, but... I'm not as invested. Like, this I enjoyed. I like the fact that Jey Uso turned the way he did. I like that this took place in the TD Garden. Survivor Series last year took place in the TD Garden when Jay hugged Sammy. Now they're in the same building three months later and Jay turns on Sammy and kicks him in the face. I thought that's, I mean, it's good storytelling all around. So I like it. But yeah, Kevin, as you say, the greatest storyline in years, pal, you know? Love to say it. Yeah, climaxing with the uh, Jey Uso and Sami Zayn hugging pal for this business. Oh yeah. Nevertheless, oh, yeah. I digress. Uh, I just want to say before we move on to WrestleMania 17 and 19, the wrestling mm-hmm. bubble is so small, bro. Like people are saying that Jey Uso is going to win Oscars and Emmy awards if he becomes <laughs> an actor after wrestling. Like, come on, give me a break, bro. Come on. Like, like uh, if a legitimate movie producer or t- uh, television producer. They're sitting down at a meeting, right? And Roman Reigns is like, hey, I got my cousin Jey Uso here. He's going to, I want him to be a part of this big movie we're making. And Roman Reigns is like, look at this exhibit A. And they're showing Sami Zayn and Jey Uso hugging from this episode of Raw. The movie producer's going to be like, all right, bro, next, uh, next meeting. Have a good day, guys. Thanks for wasting my time. Pure cinema. This was cinema. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's laughable how what's the word how like closed off from the rest of the world wrestling fans can be just because we haven't seen good storytelling on wwe tv in over 10 years does not mean that the best story that we've seen in over 10 years is a movie like that that's how deprived we are of good actual entertainment in wrestling that people think that this storyline is on par with some of the all-time great storylines which i mean okay it is to be fair but it's not the best storyline ever you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, people are just so deprived of good entertainment on WWE TV that I think uh, we that may, we may well be said. overreacting. That, that's very well said. And I think that's a perfect segue into what we're about to discuss when it comes to WrestleMania 17 and WrestleMania 19. Yes. Because on these shows, there were a number of truly excellent storylines. Now, granted, some of the storylines with these (coughs) aren't the best, (coughs) namely Vince McMahon and sedating Linda and Trish barking like a dog. That one, we'll get to that. But a number of these storylines with WrestleMania 17 and WrestleMania 19 are genuinely great storylines. And across the card of 17 and 19, each show had a number of really good, logical, really entertaining storylines involving big-time stars that you were super invested in. And yeah, with this bloodline one, I love this involving Roman, but especially this, the Usos and Sammy and KO thing as an extension, it's the best thing we've seen in a while from a story perspective with mainstream American pro wrestling. But yeah, it's not, you know, it's not some of this stuff we're watching at 17 or 19 or the Attitude Era. It's, it's, it's not quite that level, I feel like, for some things. Yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, Kevin, without further ado, unless there's anything else you want to cover. That's with- it. Current wrestling, I think we can transition seamlessly into a bit of uh, WrestleMania 17 and yeah. Yes, please. Let's do it. So essentially, um, you watched the full WrestleMania 17. Yeah. I watched WrestleMania 19 in full. We'll do a mm-hmm. little bit of comparing and contrasting. We'll look at the card. You know, we're not going to go in and give a breakdown of every single rest hold that took place in yeah. every single match. But <clears throat> we'll do a little comparison of the cards. Kind of mm-hmm. look at it like, okay, this is the opening match. So on and so forth, and see which one I guess we could see which one was better, or we could just really appreciate yeah. both of them. Like I said, well, Kevin, so and just quick thing. So with the late hate, I mean, if you're a regular listener, you'll know this. If you get out like about us section, you'll know this. We try and give you like it's what you need to know, what you need to hear. 
So this, as you, as you just said, this will not be us recapping what hold William Regal had on Chris Jericho five minutes into their IC title match at 7. That, that's not what this is. This is going to be us telling you why exactly 17 and 19 were so great. What about these shows is lacking nowadays? Like what, what makes these great that nowadays we don't have? We'll do a discussion and compare the two and talk about the best bits, maybe bring up a negative or two, but there really weren't many. And just talk about why generally these were so entertaining and why, Kevin, WrestleMania as an event, as we lead up to 39, and whether you listen to this for this year, in five years' time, just generally, Kevin, why 17, 19 are like the standard of WrestleMania. These are the top shelf WrestleMania. And Kevin, we're going to tell you great listeners why. Absolutely. And here, I guess the first thing that I want to address personally is the buy rate. That, that's like a lot of uh, that's like a lot of wrestlemania 19 whenever people point to why wrestlemania 19 is not on par with some other great wrestlemanias they look at the buy rate that's usually one of the first things brought up i mean wrestlemania 27 did 1.59 million buys and yeah that was on the, the height of or the back of rock's return and whatever wrestlemania 21 not looked at as a top 10 wrestlemania maybe a top 10 not looked at as like a top 5 wrestlemania did like 1.85 million buys wrestlemania 23 that's another wrestlemania which is not looked at as a top 10 wrestlemania of all time that did 1.2 million buys and that had trump involved so yeah nevertheless in terms of buy rate wrestlemania 17 did 1.4 million buys wrestlemania 19 did 560,000 buys that year's Royal Rumble, 2003 Royal Rumble, did like 590 for context. And why, why I think, is that? Why? Uh, why is that? Why did that happen? So here's the main reason why this happened, I, I think. WrestleMania 19, the sole promotion of this show was built around Vince McMahon versus Hulk Hogan. And not out of ego, not because Vince and Hulk Hogan were like, no, we're, we're going to be the main thing. We're the number one part of this show. No, it wasn't that. For one, Triple H was relegated to a replacement match with Booker T because Scott Steiner was just... WWE got sold a bag of goods, of false goods, and Scott Steiner wasn't able to participate at WrestleMania, so that was one big match gone. Stone Cold was literally... He literally walked out of WWE like seven months prior, so they didn't even know if he was actually going to wrestle The Rock. But then on top of that, he, he almost had a heart attack the night before. So they, they couldn't even main event. And they weren't promoted that much because, like I said, they didn't know. There was so much uncertainty where, like, if Stone Cold could physically wrestle, he was even going to be there, if he was going to walk out. They didn't know. So they didn't put any promotion behind Austin Rock, any promotion behind Triple H's match. There was no promotion behind Kurt Angle and Brock because Kurt Angle had a broken neck. And Kurt Angle, he almost dropped the belt the week prior on SmackDown to Chris Benoit. And Brock was going to wrestle Chris Benoit in, like, a replacement match. And Kurt Angle was going to have neck surgery. So by default, they had to promote Vince and Hogan because that was the only match where both guys were able to be there every week to build up the show. And people were looking at this like, we don't care about Vince and Hogan. Like, why is Vince and Hogan getting all the promotion? Like, we don't, we don't give a shit. Like, it was just looked at like this WrestleMania was looked at like, I don't need to see it. It's skippable. Mm. You know, so it was like, it was one of those things where the day of, it was like, wow. After watching it, the people that watched it were like, wow, this is a great show. And then the years and the months and following the show, it became one of the greatest WrestleManias of all time because it was better than most people expected. <coughs> Got it. And on top of that, Got Undertaker yeah. was uh, Undertaker was teaming with your boy Nathan Jones to wrestle A Train and Big Show. So Undertaker didn't even have a big match either on this show. That that's a great point. That's a great. Uh, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And now, like, I think, I mean, the builds for these shows, as you allude to, they're very different. Um, I look at WrestleMania seventeen by comparison, Kevin. They were in one of the hottest stretches of pay per views ever. The two thousand one Royal Rumble. Many people view that as the greatest Rumble event ever. Just a phenomenal show. All the star power in the world. Great booking. All around a very fun show to watch. No way out. Two thousand and one. I'd argue the best February pay-per-view ever. Just a phenomenal show, top to bottom. Just a great thing. Like Austin, Triple H, and all that sort of stuff. Great stuff. And then you transition to WrestleMania 17. WCW has just been bought. 
on the go home show. We got Vince McMahon. That's just a part of the Vince story. Like so much was happening. This was a, like a raging climax into WrestleMania 17. It was just all momentum, all guns blazing heading into this show. And as you say, the buy rates reflected it. This one, I mean, the, the, the official number on Wikipedia in generally was 1.04 million buys, which comparatively to WrestleMania 19 and their 560,000 North American buys, which I think that number would have been a bit more when you factor in international. It's probably around 700,000, but comparatively, it is a big difference. But the momentum between the two shows is like, going in with the build is hard to compare. It's, it's what, nine day. Absolutely. And I think you'll agree with this. Well, I think it's subjective. But WrestleMania 17 was the end of the Attitude Era. It was the climax. It was the absolute peak of pro wrestling's popularity. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a, I mean, that's a big factor too. WrestleMania 17 had that on its side. And it's just undoubtedly, you can't even really argue it. Wrestling has not been that popular ever since. And it's had spurts and moments. But as like a cultural phenomenon on a week-to-week -week basis, in the overall like conscious of pop culture and of the general population, wrestling was never that big again after WrestleMania 17. Yeah. And Kevin, I'll just go here with, I'll also make this point and you know, feel free to chime in here. WrestleMania 17 to me showed everything that's great about pro wrestling in one night. It was like, this show was the perfect variety show. This show had a bit of everything. It wasn't hardcore into great matches. Like it wasn't just in ring. There was a, a legendary, hilarious hardcore match with Raven, Kane, and the Big Show. There was a quick, fun watch these guys beat the crap out of each other brawl type match with Taz and the APA against the right to censor. There was a great technical in ring grappling bell to bell match with Angle and Benoit. You had TLC two which was the car crash demolition derby violent match. There was Undertaker and Triple H, which is just look at the two stars go at it sort of thing. Austin and The Rock, the big headlining, oh, oh my God, you've got to see that main event. Jericho opening, which like, uh, there's, there's just so much of this, which I mean, we'll, we'll discuss comparatively some more stuff in a moment, but I just want to make that point, Kevin. WrestleMania 17 was everything that's good about wrestling. It, it was the perfect variety show. This had a bit of everything. Absolutely. And WrestleMania 19 is so similar, too, from a, from a card standpoint, in terms of just variety. It's, they're pretty much identical, these two match cards. I think it's one of the fascinating factors in debating them. <coughs> you know, you had, like, Undertaker Triple H at WrestleMania 17. And you had Austin Rock at WrestleMania 19, where, like, these are the two big stars in a non-title match that are just, everybody's here to see these guys. Yeah. So then you had, like, you had good, entertaining matches throughout the whole card. Ray versus Matt Hardy. No, I mean, that's two Hall of Famers. Kurt and Jerkin, pal. The Cruiserweight title. That's where we were in 2003. You had those two guys on, on the opener. You know, there's just... It was something for everybody on both of these shows. WrestleMania 19 didn't have the hype and the fanfare, and as it should have, and it would have if, if uh, circumstances had been different. If we had like a proper build for Austin Rock, and that was actually headlined the way it was supposed to. And then you get a proper build for Kurt Angle versus Brock Lesnar. Forget about it. This, this match, this card would have been just as hype, if not more. Maybe more. Who knows? If they would have built around properly that this is going to be Stone Cold Steve Austin's final match, I think the buy rate would have been a little bit higher than WrestleMania 17 for WrestleMania 19. And I think there would have been more mm. fanfare. 100%. 100%. Nah, Kevin, one thing I want to say as well with that, like you mentioned the, the card structure, I want to make a point here. To me, I feel like they're quite different. Well, I mean, so similar but different. Um, similar in the sense of you know, obviously star power, names involved, and, and that sort of thing. But as far as the flow of the show, like I always, when I'd watch WrestleMania 19, it feels like the first four matches, so from the Matt Hardy Ray match through until the team angle, like, triple threat tag title match, you know, good, solid, you know, under card, mid card <laughs> matches, nothing wrong with them. And then you get to Michaels and Jericho and just feels like WWE, they're, they're throwing like, K, they're trying to throw KO punches. They've got big gun match after big gun match. They're putting all they can because you go, 
Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho, into Triple H and Booker T for the big gold belt, into Hogan and Vince McMahon, which is the big marquee match, as you mentioned, into Rock and Austin, into Brock and Angle for the title. Like it was five big you know, main event matches in a row, which I think it, it, when you watch the show, it's like you can't look away the last two and a half hours with WrestleMania 19. That's my stance. You, you watched it the other day. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, I would say 19 is more top heavy. For sure, I would say because like seventeen kind of has a little bit of that turning point with Angle Benoit, where it's like okay, business is about to pick up, but you still had the gimmick battle royal. You know, you had China versus Ivory, which was yeah. No, I, I disagree. I don't. Think, I don't think Angle Benoit was the pickup point. I think just seventeen as a show, it it, it just flowed so differently. Yeah. yeah, nineteen is very top heavy, which isn't a bad thing when you've got ten absolute Hall of Famers, you know, wrestling in the last five matches, but. Yeah, like the seventeen was just it was just d- different and it worked. So it's hard to compare that because it. I mean, both are great. It's yeah, it's apples and oranges. It's do you want a show which flows better generally, or do you want a show where the last two and a half hours, especially, you literally can't look away because it's all the stars wrestling big time matches. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like just in terms of like where the show flips is, I mean, uh, the seventeen, the turning point is like Edge and Christian, the Dudleys and the Hardys. That was where it's like, wow, okay. I don't even know what I've seen. Like, what am I watching? <laughs> but <laughs> I guess the creative way to put it would be 17 had more buffer matches. Like, you, you had Angle and Benoit, which was like this good 15-minute technical classic. They followed that with China and Ivory. And then you go from there, and then you go to Shane and Mr. Uh, Shane versus Vince. Street fight. Big story. One of the, the best built-up stories uh, the the storyline implications and the build up for this match is downplayed now because we had the infamous fish barking like a dog segment. But this was probably the second most built up match behind Austin Rock. I, I think is fair to say. You know, Triple H versus Taker was just like, okay, these guys don't have anything to do. I'm mad at you because I'm just mad at you, and we're gonna fight. So yeah, but then yeah, you go right from there to the DLC match, and then you get the Iron Sheik <laughs> winning the gimmick battle royal. It was fun it was like a fun buffer yeah so yeah the, the 17 was probably how do i say 17 was probably spread out a little bit better with 19 it's just like all right main event match after main event match after main event match yeah. which is fine too but it both works and sorry can just with that uh i had to cut you off and give you a go on ahead there but i just want to make one point there with 17 it had to have that buffer match because after tlc2 you needed a breath <laughs> like I watched this back the other day and like I watched that match. It's still I just I'm in awe of what those six well, I mean the six guys in the match and like the the two or three like extras like leader and spike and those guys and I then know. they got run and got like did. Like I was just like, oh my god. Like I was I was still for literally like ten minutes after in like ama- stunned amazement watching that. And so you had to have a gimmick battle royal. Like the placement of that was perfect. The gimmick battle royal was like a all up about eight to ten minute bit of you know a bit of fun you, know, you can have a bathroom break there or you can watch it and see the legends and a good bit of nostalgia but really you're trying to get a bit of your breath back before you know undertaker and triple h do their thing so it was necessary and it worked it, it, it fit for the show i absolutely agree well, let's look into the uh the, now let's look into the cards in more detail <laughs> so i watched most of 17 um, i took yep. good notes about pretty much everything um, i have a lot of notes yep. on 19 so uh, I guess we'll start with WrestleMania 17. So um, the intro, what, what did you think of the intro package? I, I liked it. The, the WrestleMania 17 intro package, I believe it what, was Freddie Blassie narrating. I'm not sure who was narrating it, but yeah, um, I liked it. I liked 19's intro a little bit better because you had like Rock and Kurt Angle and like Undertaker narrating. I, I just thought that was cooler listening to the wrestlers, but they were both yeah. very similar intros. It was kind of like we're getting walked through the history of pro wrestling in front of our very eyes in like a two minute package see like freddie blast the ultimate warrior hulk hogan like i thought it was awesome 100 percent. and kevin what makes watching these shows so cool is when they're doing these intros all most of the big time stars like obviously the ones from the golden era in the 80s like that they've retired for the most part by this stage you know early 2000s but there's still so many literal all-time great talents in their prime wrestling. So when you're watching these segments where you got Freddie Blassie or, you know, they're talking about the showing WrestleMania of days gone by in the 80s and the 90s, 
it's cool knowing the next four hours you're going to watch is some of the all-time great talents still in their prime that give you a phenomenal show. Whereas you compare that to nowadays, Kevin, we're watching clips of great things from, you know, the Attitude Era, the Ruth's Aggression Era, Cena in his prime, the 80s, the 90s, like a bunch of old, in many people's opinion, wrestling's best stuff's all gone by now. And nowadays we've just got whatever's left. So, yeah, those intros accompanied by the fact that how great the talent was, it makes them better, I think. Yeah, and the intro makes you hyped for what you're about to see. Like, I was, like I've seen WrestleMania 17 like a million times. And I'm yeah. watching this intro. You see, like, the old man sitting in front of the TV with the grandson. It's yeah. like, and I'm like, oh, I can't wait now. Can't wait to watch the show again. Like, I've never seen it before. Um, which I thought was and cool. Kevin, and uh, I, 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 I want to say this real quick. Yeah. In WrestleMania 38, the intro was Mark Wahlberg just being like, hey, I'm famous. Hey. <laughs> like, what happened to the intro? I couldn't, I couldn't tell you a WrestleMania intro in the world. I think LL Cool J did 31, I think. I don't know, like they're, not, they're not memorable. But WrestleMania 30's um, intro was pretty cool. Oh, that, that I remember, yes. That was, that was well done. That yeah. was well done. Go ahead. What, um, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, one thing I loved about this, like when I watched the intro, of, this is for 17, I just love this line, um, welcome to WrestleMania, a celebration of life. I thought that was very, not over the top, but like, <laughs> it's a celebration of life, pal. We're about to watch edge and christian nearly kills spike dudley like you know <laughs> absolutely yeah 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 but i just want to say too about real sweet and it's intro it's just like like i said we have the rock undertaker like i thought that was cool hearing the undertaker narrate the undertaker doesn't do stuff like that yeah hardly ever and he did more of that like promos and more breaking the fourth wall as the american badass that was so cool that intro i, I thought the 19 intro was better me personally yeah um yeah yeah Great. i just want to say that but um, no, nah, they're both they're both sick. And then one other thing I want to say, this is just a general thing before we get into like more of sort of the matches. I love how both of these shows, I mean, announcers phenomenal, but like the signs and the crowd, the crowd makes or breaks shows. We we know this with wrestling, Kevin. But both of these crowds, seventeen mainly from what I took, you know, took away, but I mean nineteen obviously as well. Both of the crowds seem so genuinely excited to be there. And that makes the show so much better. Like they're, they're panning the crowd with, I don't know, 17 particularly. And uh, so many people have signs, which to me, signs is a big one. These people, you know, want to be there and they want to make a sign to feel like they're even more a part of the show and that they can, you know, spread their voice or that sort of thing and get on TV maybe. Like it, I just like that. It, it just, it's a great part of wrestling. It's something that we don't really see much now. It's, it's become very like a, a days gone by thing. With really invested crowds, signs, you hardly see it anymore. I mean, we saw it a bit with Raw last night with Cena's return, but even then, just the signs, the engagement, the the great announcing, Jim Ross welcoming us to WrestleMania, like that, that sort of thing is just <sighs> it's something we won't really ever get again, to be honest. But it was just great. It's great to look back on. Yeah, nineteen too. It was in an outdoor baseball stadium. You could hear the crowd the whole time going crazy, which is I know to the, that. Like you said, days gone by, that era wrestling was and how hyped people were for it. It's it's really yeah. it's really cool to see. Uh, one thing, too, I wanted to note was Paul Heyman and, J- and uh, Jim Ross on commentary. I thought they were a great duo. I don't, I don't want to say they're better than Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler, but Paul Heyman was damn good at WrestleMania 17. Yeah. No, I agree. Agree, pal. And I think we can transition. Do you want to just discuss openers now? Yeah. Um, just to kind of compare them, um, I, I, one thing I will say about both of these, the charisma of these wrestlers, now I know it's, it's a bit of you know, a tangible one, but like I watched Jericho come out here, for the, the 17 opener with the IC title match versus Regal. And he's not doing anything extreme. He's not you know, doing some big promo. It's not some big performance. But he's just so, like O1 Jericho, so naturally charismatic. I'm watching this going, this is just a cool, likable talent, which is something I'd hardly ever feel nowadays. I, WWE, I guess, want us to feel that looking at theory and guys like that. It's just not there. But I look at Jericho come out. I looked at you know, Matt Hardy with 19. It's very similar. You watch the guys, like they've just got like a natural thing to them. It's hard to describe. Kevin, I don't know if you kind of felt the same way watching it, but seeing Jericho, seeing Matt Hardy, those guys, especially with these openers, it's just opening with a, a charismatic, entertaining guy who can 
wrestle a great match at the start and you know, make a fun show. But with, uh, with Jericho especially, when he opens like his music hits and that's the first thing we're seeing from a wrestling perspective, a WrestleMania 17, you're looking at that guy, you're like, this guy could main event this WrestleMania. He could main event this WrestleMania, he could main event the next seven WrestleMania. Yeah. And that was, uh, I guess that's more like an ode to the wealth of talent that WWE had at that time. Then it really is like a, a downgrade on the wrestlers nowadays. I mean, WWE was just so deep, Hall of Famers. Yeah, like like I said, Jericho, and then he's gonna go on and become the first undisputed champion like five six months, seventeen. So yeah, it was just um, star power, you know. And then with the intro for nineteen, it was or I'm sorry, not the intro, the opening match, Matt Hardy versus Rey Mysterio. I'm watching this. I'm like, wow, yeah. I mean, this is big time, but it's not as big time as like watching Jericho. Watching like one of the top fifteen guys ever open a WrestleMania, it was it was really surreal to kind of see that. So Matt and Ray didn't hit the same, but still you have like Ray Mysterio opening yeah. the show. Ray Mysterio is a big star, big baby face. The crowd's going nuts for him. The crowd's reacting for Matt Hardy. The investment was just there, top to bottom, which is something that we really don't see anymore. Like nowadays, you know, people will be invested in maybe two or three matches on the card. People be invested in Cena Theory, they'll be invested in Reigns Cody, be invested in whatever they do with Sami Zayn, the bloodline. And we might we won't see that same investment in the uh in the whole totality of the card. Literally the opening match for nineteen was literally just Matt Hardy and Rey Mysterio are just mad at each other because they're mad at each other. There was no there was no storyline built up to yeah. it. <clears throat> People are still invested. And what I wanna say about Jericho versus Regal, looking mm-hmm. back at it, like where I am now in my life. That storyline was so atrocious. Like they literally had a match because Jericho pissed in Regal's teeth. Yeah, I want to, yeah, I want to get your thoughts on that. But yeah, go on, keep going. Yeah, that was. I just wanted to say that was atrocious. Like they they were wrestling these are two grown men wrestling because one grown man pissed in another grown man's cup of tea. Yeah, like that that was no. kind of like the. It shows you the wonkiness that existed in the attitude era that a lot of people with hindsight pretend didn't exist. Yeah, I was thinking, I I watched that like they showed the coming out they showed that video package i'm thinking to myself if something like that happened nowadays like a wrestler like a british wrestler for instance was the commissioner like a european was and then the baby face the the, the big bit was that they pissed in the tea and then regal's drinking tea going this doesn't taste like tea and he's like freaking out <laughs> that, that would people would be acting as though vince mcmahon was saving himself and the WWE needs to go out of business you know, like if that if that was around in the Twitter age, that would go over so poorly. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, people would hate it. But I, I mean, agree. There's something about this, I was watching, going, I mean, it just kind of works here. Like maybe because Jericho is so good that it just works. But I don't know. It, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The intro, you had a top fifteen guy going at it. Regal, it was great. And the intro for nineteen, you know, you had Rey Mysterio, one of the all time greats. Matt Hardy is an all time great tag team wrestler, very recognizable. People that don't watch wrestling know who Matt Hardy is. Yeah. Just an O to the talent. Uh, the next thing that I want to spend a few minutes on mm. from WrestleMania 19 is yep. Limp Bizkit's performance. I mean, yeah, we saw it in 17. We saw um, Motorhead perform Triple H for the ring, which we're going to talk about. Yep. Limp Bizkit singing The Undertaker down to the ring in the second match of the card. This is the most out of place entrance <laughs> you could ever imagine. If if I showed someone just the entrance of Undertaker, just Limp Bizkit, Fred Durst going crazy, having the crowd in the palm of his hands, you know, we're rolling, rolling, rolling. Fred Durst going, he's on crack, he's going nuts. Like, this is peak Limp Bizkit. This is the band that is blamed for ruining the world at Woodstock 99, out here at WrestleMania 19 in 2003. Like I said, Fred Durst on crack, going absolutely ballistic. Undertaker comes out. You would think that this match is about to set up. Like you would think Undertaker's about to face Brock Lesnar in the main event. We're gonna have a street fight, knockdown war between Brock what? Lesnar and the Undertaker. The Undertaker makes his entrance, he's getting cheered. You know, the whole crowd is applauding, standing ovation, they're bowing down to him. Undertaker comes in the ring, daps up Fred Durst. Fred Durst gets the hell out of there. Undertaker is like hyping the crowd up. Here we are. We're about to have Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar, undisputed title. No, the big show comes out after this. The big show. The big show in A-Train. Undertaker got... This is what I wrote in my notes. 
Undertaker had an entrance fit for an icon. The match was not fit for an icon. I love that. Unbelievable. I love that. Like, Kevin, it's like, continue. It's continue. night and day. It's night and day. You watch the entrance, and then you get the match. It, like, the, the, this, this still triggers a lot of people. 20 years later, <laughs> Undertaker wrestled Big Show at A-Trade. Undertaker needed your favorite wrestler, Australia's very own, a, a 10 most wanted criminal in Australia, Nathan Jones. Mm -hmm. Undertaker needed Nathan Jones' help. At arguably the second greatest or third greatest, whatever, top five, arguably the greatest WrestleMania of all time. Undertaker needed Nathan Jones' help. Kevin, one question I will ask. With hindsight now, who or what, like, who should The Undertaker have wrestled instead on this show? Like, if you were, like, had your, you know, <coughs> you got the pen, it's, it's, it's December 2002, you're, right, you're putting this show together. What would you do? Because obviously a one-on-two handicap match where The Undertaker comes out with Limp Biscuit and then takes on Lord Tensai and his hairy back and Big Show, it, 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 could you do better, I assume? Like... Well, there's two guys that I look at in particular that were on the undercard. And that's Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. You could have had either one of them wrestle Undertaker. And it would have been great. I, I would probably lean towards Benoit. Just because in 03, Benoit was presented more of a, as a main eventer. Benoit had a big time feud with The Rock. and thousand. He, had, he just came off of a great WWE title match with Kurt Angle like two months before this show. Mm -hmm. Benoit was presented more of a main eventer than Eddie, so I would have probably leaned Benoit. But I think that's like that—that's a home run of a match right there. That's a match worthy of Undertaker at WrestleMania. That's a match worthy of Fred Durst, Fred Durst on cocaine, screaming Undertaker down to the ring. Oh hell yeah! Nah, I I know I know what you're saying. This is just so funny to me. Like you go from as you perfectly described that incredible entrance. You go like yeah. Can you post the video on your Twitter and just like watching that text? Is everything you said? You think it was the big, gonna be the biggest WrestleMania main event ever with that entrance, the crowd, all of it, and then within three seconds they're cutting to the clip from Sunday Night Heat of A Train with his hairy back in the shower beating up Nathan Jones. Like Ridiculous. it's just rubbish. Like, what is that? Bro, that's my favorite Australian, Nathan Jones. He was formerly. The most wanted man in the outback 30 years ago. And that guy, Vince McMahon, put him on his payroll and said, Oh, pal, at WrestleMania, you're going to team with Mark Calloway, the Undertaker, against A Train. Oh, yeah. Actually, no, you're not. We're going we're gonna to scrap you for the match, pal. Oh, yeah. yeah if, uh, if Undertaker was cut from the same cloth as like CM Punk or Stone Cold, he would have quit the, the day that Vince McMahon presented this match to him. Oh yeah, okay. literally. Okay. Nevertheless, <coughs> to transition just for a moment, pal. Yep. Yeah, I, I think Undertaker versus Benoit. I just want to hammer this home. Undertaker mm -hmm. versus Benoit. That could have been built up into a legitimate force on this card. You could have just had Team Angle versus Los Guerreros two on two yeah. for the tag team championship, and had Undertaker versus Benoit. Like, I, I do you. What do you think? Do you think there's another match out there that I'm not seeing or that? Like, like, what, no, what could you have done, I think, Taker? I think you bang on. I think you bang on. I think you could have done, yeah, Angle versus Guerreros for the, the tag titles. That would have been more than fine. And then you, you knew Benoit with Rhino, as in so Benoit versus Undertaker one-on-one. -on -one. Rhino's in the corner, running interference. You can do a good, like, 15-minute match. This doesn't need to go 25 minutes, but a really good, like, 15-minute match here with Benoit. That would have elevated Benoit more than the tag match. I think that would have been... The kind of not not the missing piece to nineteen just would have been an extra cherry on top of this show that instead we got Undertaker versus Big Show and A Train, which is just it's one of the one of the biggest sort of like why wrestling matches yeah. in hindsight. But, but yeah. yeah, like why? And, and here's one that might blow people's minds. Maybe you could have just had Undertaker face Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. Instead of you know Triple H and Ric Flair running around being racist in, in the ghettos in America. Yeah. Throwing money at, at people, at poor people, saying people like this should never be world champion. We'll and get they, to that. Yeah. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely going to get to that. But I mean, and another thing, too, which we're going to speak about is later on, but Benoit was so over. 
at this show. Ben Wall, people never talk about it because we, we just don't talk about Ben Wall anymore. Ben Wall was one of the most over wrestlers in the company in the early 2000s, in mid 2000s. People loved him. You know, in hindsight, it's weird watching it, but Ben Wall literally was one of the biggest baby faces on this show. Nevertheless, crazy, you know. hey? Crazy. Right. And also, uh, yeah, I was going to touch on one thing, um, not to totally overhaul the conversation, but just with the second match of 17, I just want to really quickly say. One thing I love watching this, so keep in mind, this is the uh, right to censor against the APA and Taz. Very short match. It's, it's not ever supposed to be some five-star classic, but the match was just perfect. It's literally six big guys, and Taz, I mean, he's short, but he's a jacked mofo you don't want to mess with sort of thing. Like, he's not a guy to mess with. He, he's a legit tough guy, and you can see that just by looking at him. Taz, and then these just five beasts. These heavyweight monsters just beating the crap out of each other for like three minutes. This brutal, fun, fast-paced match. A match like that it just works for a wrestling show. You, you take the undercard guys, make it fun, make it quick. You, know, you don't lose your interest. You don't lose your attention. They had the quick segment with the APA backstage where Bradshaw's getting cheap pops, bringing up Texas. And then you had Bradshaw's the hometown guy come out. Just Kevin... I don't think we need to go into great depth on like that match with the six man tag on the undercard of WrestleMania 17. But my big takeaway is just these wrestlers, especially back in the day, were just in much better shape. This was the other thing. Like these wrestlers in this match, Ron Simmons is one of the most like jacked guys in wrestling. Like he's just the, the physique on that guy is nuts. All the, the right to censor guys are just jacked heavyweights. Bradshaw in 01 was a beast and Taz was a guy you just don't mess with. So my big takeaway, Kevin, from that is just these wrestlers were, for the most part, just built different back in the day from the aesthetics point of view. Not to say all, all wrestlers nowadays are scrawny midgets. I'm not saying that, but just you look at these guys, the eye test tells you like these guys are, are not to be messed with. They're legit. Yeah. And I really like the promo beforehand with JBL just running through Texas history. They're in the Astrodome, like I thought that was cool. Talking about like Nolan Ryan and some of the wrestlers he watched back in his day growing up. Yeah, I thought that was good. It, JBL always brought the intensity. Um, yeah, yeah. This opening match, it was nothing to write home about. Or, I'm sorry, this this uh, this second match, it was nothing really to write home about. One thing I noted was that you could kind of see the writing on the wall for the end of the Attitude Era. And literally, the name of the faction was Right to Censor, and they came out <laughs> and they told people not to be adult orientated. Like that was their gimmick, you know. So they were like, um, they're like the network pal, silencing people. And yeah, for the match with Undertaker and Big Show and A Train, I just have no comment. But that was my note. Um, yeah, I have no comment. That's great. Well, Kevin, I think we can transition to a match which I know we both have. Lost. To me, this was. Wait, wait. Before we get to that, yeah. I have I have something I have I noted as well. We had a lot of segments on WrestleMania 17, a lot of backstage segments. We had a, mm. we had um, the JBL promo, you know. Yep. That, then we had this Trish, Lita. I'm not Lita. I'm sorry, Trish, Stephanie, and Linda McMahon segment where Trish Stratus. It's just so funny watching Trish Stratus walking in Linda McMahon, a sedated Linda McMahon in a wheelchair. <laughs> Stephanie McMahon is like in Trish Stratus's face, like, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna show you. Not to mess with my family. And I'm just like, bro, like, we, how cool is this backstage segment? We don't really see that at WrestleMania. Just kind of go from match to match to match. And yeah. Well, Kevin, that, that's one other thing with the floor. Like, I didn't even mention this. I mean, there was one before I just. And the, they pan the camera to WCW1. And like, like just little stuff. And they, they, they bounce from thing to thing. Like, you go Shane in there, then they cut to Bradshaw in the APA, and he's talking about Texas and well, the history of there, and he's getting pops, and then you go to the match, and then, yeah, this Stephanie, Trish, Linda segment, that visual's ridiculous. Yeah. Linda McMahon's sedated. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll go into great detail on that very shortly. But, yeah, that, that's just a great, fun segment, Kevin. And there, there was many more of these, and <laughs> we'll talk about this in a moment. But, like, for instance, about – you know, 20 minutes later, the next one, like when The Rock arrives, one like that. I love how they did that. When like that show The Rock and Austin arriving, I love that. That's that's for the main eventers, I think that that's something that we don't see ever nowadays. We don't see them cut the camera backstage with the crowd erupting. Roman Reigns is arriving. 
like during the show. Like they don't do stuff really like that. Maybe Reigns will arrive at the start of a SmackDown every like month, maybe. But like during a pay per view, especially if something this magnitude, stuff like that works. And just these backstage segments, Kevin, it all works. Absolutely. Now, please yep. tell us about this uh, this triple threat hardcore match. Oh my god, this. <laughs> It's not the best match on the show, but this might have been the most entertained I was watching this show. And to, to many, you think a triple threat hardcore match that went third on the card is the hardcore title. Why should I care? But you watch this match and it is just genuine fun. Like, it's just like Kane, near enough at the height of his like, like physique wise, Kane is an absolute jack seven foot monster. Wearing a, he's just eliminated 11 guys in the Royal Rumble. This is the style power at 17. He was just the most dominant force at the Royal Rumble, the most stacked, best Rumble ever. Now, two months later, he's wrestling the third match for the hardcore title. You've got the Big Show in there as well, which, Kevin, can we just say the placement of Big Show at these WrestleManias, 17 and 19, is just hilarious. It's comical. And then you get Raven, who's just the, the nominal hardcore champion. This match was so fun. Like, it's just, you're watching these guys, like, the way Kane and Big Show punch each other and they, like, the noises they make when they hit each other, the objects, the weapons they use in this. Like, I love just the, the golf cart spot, especially, Kevin. We've literally, Kane, this seven-foot-tall monster demon from hell, gets on a golf cart with a referee and is driving, he's speeding in the golf cart backstage <laughs> of the arena and runs over Raven's leg and Raven like screams in pain. <laughs> like it's just, it's just, who writes this stuff? Like that, that, that is just only in pro wrestling. That, I don't know, Kevin, over to you. I, I loved it. It was such a blast. Yeah, we don't see matches like this. Anymore. We really don't. Like I don't want to be that guy that's like, oh, wrestling matches were built different or they were better back in the day. But we don't see wrestling matches like this anymore at all. You don't see a match that takes place fully in the backstage that I can think of. If we see like these PG hardcore matches, like I think of like Shane McMahon versus Miz from WrestleMania a few years ago, that was okay. You know, just the Miz, the Miz, bro. Uh, Raven has more charisma in his pinky than the Miz has in his entire body, pal. Nevertheless, I digress. Um, when Raven got thrown through the window by Kane, like I was like, wow. Like that was that a real window? Because Kane was—I mean, not Kane. Raven was bleeding. Raven was like bleeding from his neck. <laughs> like was that, was that yeah. real? Did he really go through a glass I, I window? I, this is two thousand and one, so I don't, I don't know if they were doing like the the fake sugar glass stuff. Yeah, I don't know. And I, like, I loved this... Paul Heyman on commentary being like, "No, not the peach snapple." <laughs> they got peach snapple back there. Like that was so oh, funny. You got the God, lettuce I... flying in the camera. <laughs> Like, this was ridiculous, bro. This was a ridiculous match. The, oh, this was phenomenal. I just, like, the, when Kane and Big Show are punching backstage, like, I love when Big Show throws Raven into, like, the area where the APA, and Big Show spends, like, 30 seconds failing to, like, lock the door, and Kane just comes in and just rips the door <laughs> open and just starts beating up Big Show. <laughs> what is this? Oh, I, it's I, fantastic. I love it. Fantastic. It's just, like, it's just, like, and Kevin, you can't do this really today because of, like, star power. Like, because Kane and Big Show are involved, it makes it that much better. Like, these are two legit guys, and it's just so much more fun when you're invested because of how big the star is. Like, if they did an undercard match like this, you're not going to have Roman Reigns third on the show doing a hardcore trash like this. You're just not going to see it. You're not going to see any of the, you're not going to see Drew McIntyre doing this sort of stuff. But back, back in 01, Kevin, th this was just... It was 10 minutes. I've, wa I've watched this back so many times. I, oh, I this would be a I perfect play. match for like Drew McIntyre and Sheamus to have right oh, nowadays. Man, be, yeah. yeah. I imagine you like, got Corey Graves screaming about the Snapple and catering as Sheamus is getting thrown across the lunch table. Like, yeah, this is a perfect sort of WrestleMania match, but if you're not going to use Drew McIntyre, and fair enough, do something like this. Drew, Sheamus, and insert wrestler here, whoever. A, like a like a Put ricochet a, in there or something anything, anything goes match a triple threat like that'd be a blast but yeah kevin this was just one of the most as you hear how i talk about it i, I was so much fun watching this it was so entertaining the the camera getting 
like the lettuce or like whatever from catering, like splattered all over it. You have like the golf carts, like seeing the big show on a golf cart, then Kane speeding after him with the referee. The referee looked like he didn't know what was happening. And then they, they get eventually down to the stage. You got JR screaming. Kane jumps off the stage and I uh, just great. Just excellent. Like, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, speaking about the similarities to this card. So mm. after the second match of WrestleMania 19, we also got a women's segment. And then we had a triple threat match to follow that women's segment. And then Eddie Guerrero was on the fourth match uh, in both shows. Wow. But, Let's talk Eddie. Now, I want to hold discuss on, hold this. On, hold on. Before, before I gotta, we got to talk about this, uh, this segment of WrestleMania 19. So we had the Miller Lite girls meeting Stacey Keebler and Tori Wilson. In my notes, I have one word. Wow. I mean, this... Again, we don't see backstage segments like this. They literally had four attractive women arguing about what the better match is, Austin Rock or McMahon Hogan. Like that in and of itself, just hearing just seeing four women, listening to four women argue over wrestling is uh it's it's um interesting. Interesting to see. It was very nice, very pleasant. Kevin, could you imagine nowadays if they did something like that where they had like, you know, renowned famous women who are literally just like the mill like i don't even know a comparison like you imagine that they pull i don't even know like, like, the, like the dallas adult... cowboys cheater the cheerleaders yeah. like you have like two dallas cowboy cheerleaders there hanging out with like toxic attraction yeah and they're like roman cody usos ko zane like they're like they're... yeah that'd be fire <laughs> that'd be fire yeah oh there was a God. tremendous amount of work rate on display in this backstage segment yeah nevertheless i digress uh, I, I do have a couple of notes about trish versus victoria versus jazz for the women's yeah. championship what were your notes pal oh uh, this was a good match this was a good women's match on a wrestlemania it wasn't like a bathroom break it went they went what like how long did they go like 15 minutes 10 minutes they went 10 minutes you had stevie richards there former member of right to censor also making his presence felt um he was in Victoria's corner. But nevertheless, this match took place before the women's revolution. You know, before like the WWE branded women's revolution. Sasha and Charlotte and <clears throat> you know, Stephanie McMahon patting herself on the back every single week. But we had no mention ever, like when in WWE on WWE TV nowadays, we get no mention ever of matches like this. Where it's like they just pretend that everything that happened prior to 2015 involving women's wrestling, it was like all bra and panties and mud matches and, you know, horny men screaming. Yeah. Like it was like it was pleasantly surprising because I haven't seen the show in a while. It reminded me that women's wrestling was actually good at points. My childhood it wasn't all just nonsense like WWE tells you that it is. It's a good call. Good call. Not nah, agree. And yeah, this was a good it just there yeah, it was a, it was a good match which for the stereotype of women's wrestling in 2003 uh, i wouldn't even like most people make it out that in 2003 there wasn't even women's wrestling it was just women being there to just be you know just there for the sake of trying to keep ratings going throughout a show to keep eyeballs glued but now this was a good match this was good trish this is near enough her like Apex, from yeah. a, I mean, from a ring standpoint, probably. Nice. Um, obviously, you know, one, it was her kind of star power Apex from the storyline point of view, which we'll get to. But yeah, no, just a good match. Uh, yeah, that's really yeah, all I, I I'll say, say this but... real quick before we move on. Jerry Lawler was hilarious. Like, uh, Trish Stratus pulled Victoria's tights for like two seconds and you saw her ass for like two seconds. And Jerry Lawler's freaking out like, oh boy. Just great. Just fantastic. Um, last thing I'll say too, we, we had a rock promo. Before the, the next match at WrestleMania 19, after the, the women's triple threat, go back to The Rock. And this is Hollywood Rock, peak Hollywood Rock, being interviewed. I don't remember who was interviewing him. I think it was Kevin Kelly. And he's just like, this is the absolute apex of The Rock. This was the end of his prime in WWE. He's here cutting a promo, talking about how the fans booed him at WrestleMania 18, how they booed him at SummerSlam, how they booed him at WrestleMania 17. And then he just delivers like an all-time classic line where he's like, in Hollywood, there's three acts. Third act is the one that mattered. Like, yeah, Austin, you beat me in act one and act two, but I'm going to beat you in the one that's most memorable, act three. And he just walks off and it's like, wow. 
And we're about to see two icons go at it. And this was a promo in the middle of WrestleMania. And something else we just don't see very often. Just a great promo like that. Well, Kevin, that was... I mean, that goes to show you what a great talker does for the show. Like, just even a line like that gets you so much more excited for the match. And that's, that's all it takes. So, yeah. There Absolutely. You go. All right, now let's talk Eddie, pal. What, what, do you, what did you want to say? Uh, yeah, my sort of main takeaway <clears throat> from this. So, obviously, uh, we're, we're, very, we're comparing these shows. Eddie had basically the same position on each show. Um, on 17, it was the, the fourth match of the night in a European title match against Test. At 19, it was the fourth match of the night in a tag title triple threat. Um, I think, yeah, the triple threat tag title match, it was just a better match. I mean, look at who's involved. Yeah. But the main, the main takeaway just generally to me when I'm watching, particularly 17, um, 19 was more so just you know watching the match itself as it is. But at 17, I'm watching it just going, when the charisma and like I talked about this with Jericho, but just like it's like it's like a natural thing. It, it, you can't really describe it almost. Like you have to just watch. In this case, it's Eddie from 17 or Jericho from the opening of set. It's just guys like that just have an it factor to them, which once again, most people today in res- wrestling don't have. Like Eddie, it was just you have to almost watch it. It's hard to describe, but the way he goes about it, the, the way he engages the audience, the way he just gets wrestling, he's like so intelligent. And the way he engages, the natural, like, like even in this match, there was the big botch in, at 17 where Tess got his foot stuck in the rope and it was, it was kind of awkward. Eddie being there made it out to be okay, even though you had like him and the ref trying to pull him out. Like they made it work. It was fine. And I don't know, just uh, Kevin, my, my takeaway from the Eddie stuff on both shows, just the greatness of the man. And I know Eddie's your favorite. I'll let you, I'll bounce, I'll bounce pass over to you here. That was my takeaway from this sort of segment of Atrocity Mania. Yeah, I have two big takeaways about Eddie, aside from everything you said, to add to what you were saying. For one, in 2001, Eddie Guerrero, he could pick up Test for a suplex. He picked him up like it was nothing for a suplex. You think a guy like Finn Balor could pick up a guy Test size? Right now, for a suplex like that, no. Like Eddie was five foot six in shape. But what's Sami Zayn's excuse? What's Kevin Owens' excuse for not looking like a wrestler? Like I, I hate to say it like that, but Eddie, Ben Wall, Matt Hardy, even guys like that that were smaller guys, they were all in shape. Look at Rhino. Rhino's in phenomenal shape. Shelton Benjamin, Charlie Haas, Pablo Guerrero. All these guys are in fantastic shape. Another thing too about this uh, this match with Test. What the hell is Perry Saturn wearing? Like <laughs> that fur hat, bro. Nevertheless, nevertheless. Um, yeah, Eddie again is like like with Jericho. You're watching an, a top fifteen guy in the middle of the card at one of the greatest WrestleManias of all time, and you know you're watching a top fifteen guy. He's yeah. not, and he's and neither one of them, Jericho or Eddie, weren't even there yet in 2001 in their career. Jericho became cemented a few months later. Eddie took a little bit longer due to his you know personal battles and whatnot. But it was it was there. You could see it with both guys. And Eddie, it was just yeah, the natural charisma. And it was this like this low on the card. See it. And Eddie was doing great stuff like 2000 and 2001. But the Latino heat stuff with China and all those funny segments. Uh, I think he was gone shortly after. Pretty sure after this, after so I don't think he was around very long in 2001, just due to you know personal issues. <clears throat> yeah, but nevertheless, yeah, this triple threat tag team match it was a good match. Like I said earlier, Ben Wall got in a, a it's a thunderous reaction, crazy. Watching it back, like Ben Wall was the most over guy in the match. And he could have easily been champion. Like it was, it was a no-brainer. Why didn't made him champion? Or yeah, pal. Um, let's see. What else do we have? I'll, I'll um I'll mention a couple things, and we can kind of transition and keep this moving smoothly. Um, you, you mentioned Benoit there and his role. His role at seventeen, which is what comes next on seventeen. This match against Kurt Angle, which once again 
to like in many cases, this match could main event of the year, basically. Cone Angle versus Chris Benoit. Yeah, but it's just casually, you know, middle of the show. And it just it's a testament to the, the star power on this show. And one thing I want to mention as well, just around this part of the show, once again, we mentioned backstage segments. I know it's 17. There's a Mick Foley interview that just works. That was good. Stone Cold arrives. Like oh. he's he's like mean mugging. He's looking really serious. He's locked in. It gets you more excited of what's to come. Yes. But yeah, Chris Benoit, you mentioned how over he was at WrestleMania 19 and that tag title match. 17 here. This whole thing with Kurt Angle. I loved it earlier yes. on the WrestleMania for 17. Kurt Angle's intensely watching back what happened on SmackDown. Okay. Yeah, I haven't got he's it like, he's incensed. He can't believe what happened. He's desperate to, you know, beat Benoit okay. and not What's never that? tap again. And he, he hates that. Like okay. something like we, we don't see wrestlers during pay-per-views or before their match. They're, they're never watching the monitor, okay. like frustrated at what happened on Raw or SmackDown. Like, Something like that okay, makes well, that, you go, well, okay, what happens on Raw or SmackDown matters. The wrestler genuinely okay. cares. It affects their how they feel. It affects the storyline. It affects okay. the pay-per-view. Something that simple, Kevin. That's my takeaway. Okay, awesome. Kurt Angle intensely watching the screen of that him tapping the Benoit awesome. and Edge and Christian coming in trying to add some comedy. The Kurt Angle being like, go away. I'm, I'm locked in here. Some, it makes Kurt Angle's character very legitimate, credible. When he's out there, it matters because it matters to him. This is the sort of stuff that when Cena's roasting Austin Theory saying, you don't care about you, so why should we? It's this sort of stuff. Like, it's, it's little, but it matters. And, Kevin, this Kurt Angle-Chris Benoit match, 14 minutes of these two just, you know, maestros of what they do, maestros of the in-ring, the grappling, the technical stuff, just doing their thing. It was fun to watch. It worked. It fit, and it was great. Yeah, this is, again, another similarity that we see between these two, this, these two cards. We had Kurt Angle versus Ben Wald, WrestleMania 17. Then at 19, we had Shawn Michaels versus Jericho. Like, the two guys that are in there just for their work rate. How good of a match it could be. Now, yeah, Jericho and Michaels had a great story. And I, I think that match was better, personally. I would rank that higher than this angle Ben Wald match. I think yeah. Jericho yeah. and Shawn was a... Uh, that, that's casually a top 15 to 20 wrestling match of all time, just sitting in the mid-card of like, WrestleMania. Yeah. And that was another thing, too, like... This match, like, I don't think anybody really knew it was going to be. Sean had just came back. Jericho, it was still, like, for whatever reason, WWE still thought Jericho couldn't really deliver big moments. Like, he had just made it a year prior, and it kind of fell flat. So this was, this was big for both guys. Both guys really had a lot to prove. Storyline, so simple, yet effective. Which, again, is something we don't see nowadays with mid-card matches. Nowadays, you know, Cena in theory, which could be kind of like a match, like you mentioned, it could be compared to these matches. The, the story for Cena in theory is Cena burying theory viciously on the mic, and theory not really having anything to say, essentially. Here you've got Shawn Michaels and Jericho. Jericho's like, I'm the, the current. Shawn Michaels, you're the past. I'm the current star. I'm the current best worker. I'm the wrestler in the world. <clears throat> And then Sean is like, no, I'm the old lion. I'm here to prove that I belong. And then these two, they had a, a chess match. It was an absolute chess match. It was just nothing but counters. It, you could tell that they were equal footing. Like, okay, Sean is just as good as Jericho. Jericho's just... Sean beats Jericho just barely. And then he, like, the, the post-match storytelling was exceptional. It was cinema, pal. Yeah, Sean, absolute, he's uh he, absolute, uh, absolute cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Sean extends his hand timidly for Jericho after the match. Jericho's like, nah man, we're gonna hug. And then he low blows him after the hug, and it's like, wow, crazy. I mean and, and but remember, pal, WWE has not done anything like this before. And Jimmy Uso and Jay U and Sami Zayn and Jay Uso, they're the only people that have ever done something like this, pal. But nevertheless, this is cinema. Like this match Watching this match is an example of why I watch matches like Roman Reigns versus Sami Zayn with a callus, and I'm just like, okay, well, how is this different than Sean and Jericho from 20 years prior? Like, what makes this, what makes that bloodline feud and storyline that much better? Where it's like on another planet compared to matches and storylines like this. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, I, I agree with most of that. 
um, particularly because yeah, like a match like this, I love the, the wording is so accurate from you. That it's just it was just a five star classic top fifteen or twenty all time wrestling matches sitting in the middle of the show, and that's what that was with Jericho and Michaels. That was I love that match. I think it's excellent. It's it's hard with Shawn Michaels because he's had he's had so many just all time great WrestleMania matches, but. You know, that's one of his best. So that's that, 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 the Kurt Angle match from 21 and the WrestleMania 25 match with The Undertaker <laughs> are, are his three best, I think. I'm probably forgetting one or two, but. Uh, match you with, know. with Angle. I, I said that, Angle oh, 21. Did. Oh, my bad. Yeah. And I think, because then you can argue like the, the triple threat at 20, which Vince doesn't want you to remember happened. And then the 26 main okay. event against The Undertaker. And even, I mean, the match against Rick Flair. Like, Sean's just phenomenal. We know that. But yeah, this was. Great. Um, I think, obviously, yeah, Sean and Jericho was better than Angle and Benoit. Very different matches, though. Um, but they both still play on a bit of a technical element. So, yeah, no, I think they're both great. I think they both work. What, what did I say that you disagree with? I'm curious. Oh, just about how, um, yeah, because with Michaels and Jericho, obviously, that was, that was great. The story time. I agree with what you say there with why it kind of jades your perspective on um, the bloodline and reigns and stuff. But the only thing I'd say is that Elimination Chamber match with the crowd, the crowd for that was just different than this um, Sean and Jericho match. The crowd was so much louder and hotter in Montreal for that. Just in that instance, I'd, I'd just... But that was a, a, like a one-off thing, so... Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I just want to say just a few more notes about this Jericho-HBK match. I, I love when Jericho has gone in the walls of Jericho. And, and Sean, like, hits the rope or whatever, and Jericho's just screaming at the referee, he tapped out! He tapped out! It's good, good little nuances that yeah. make Jericho and Sean just so great. You know, the crowd was into the match. Like, the crowd was really into the match. You, you can't really hear it a lot because it's an outdoor stadium. But the crowd was super into this match. Not at the beginning, but the way they built it up, by, like, 10, 12 minutes in, the crowd doesn't care who wins. They just want to see somebody win. They're just like watching a great match. Like they're not like, oh, I love Sean or I love Jericho. Like these are, they were two great stars in their prime, and people were just enjoying the match, which is cool. Um, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and then when Sean, when Sean hit the elbow and he goes into the tuning of the band and the crowd is exploding, it, it's like watching Michael Jordan hit a game winner. Just, you're watching one yeah. of the greatest to ever do it in his element. Good stuff. Nevertheless, no, pal. I love that point. No, I agree. Um, I think we can sort of move along here to oh, the next. Okay. I, I want to say one thing. I'm sorry. One thing about the Angle Benoit match. But watching Benoit do the headbutt across the ring. Mm. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Mm. That, that's yeah. tough to watch. That's tough to watch. Mm. Yeah, I just Honestly, want to say that. I, pal, what I want to do now, not to dismiss China and Ivory, I think we'll, we, we can get to that in a moment, but what I want to do is discuss. What on each show was the most, you know, sort of controversial, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. in, in terms of the storyline, but the matches. So you got Triple H and Booker T <clears throat> on one hand, which we, we, we'll discuss that. A storyline all about literal racism was the storyline. That's on one hand. On the other hand, you've got Vince McMahon making Trish bark like a dog, sedating his wife, beating his children, <laughs> like a, a whole company getting bought the week of WrestleMania. Like, so much encompassed both of these. There was a lot of mess involving each of them, Kevin. Um, and I think we this deserves a good segment of this show. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't know where to really begin with this. Um, they're, they're both very different. They're both infamous in their own way. Uh, I guess, how do you, watching these back, like, I guess, how do you feel watching these back? Because, like, I watched for, for 17, firstly. I watched this and go... Like, I physically cannot believe they got away with this. I mean, granted, there was media hate at the time. Like, Vince McMahon went on that interview in, like, March of 01 and got, like, grilled for that, what, the Trish Barkin, like, a dog segment. Like, that did happen. But even still, watching this back, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, ha- like this happened in WWE. This was a legit storyline for months. And then, on the contrary, with WrestleMania 19, Kevin, Triple H and Booker T, some of the segments they did, some of the promos Triple H cut, and Triple H and Flair exploring the ghetto. I was like, how do they get away with some of this stuff? I just, I don't know, Kevin, it's over to you. Yeah, it's remarkable. It's re- it really is remarkable. 
Uh, I hope we do circle back because there are some things before this that I want to talk about at WrestleMania yeah, 19. I want to have a good discussion on this before we circle back. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, so yeah, so you had Triple H versus Booker T. And this, the build-up in this match, what I want to say, I don't want to get too much heat, but I want to make sure I word this correctly. When you actually go back and watch the match, I think WWE realized they made a ton of mistakes in the build-up. And they weren't, they didn't really show... In the promo package, they didn't show any of that stuff of Triple H like telling Booker to dance and Triple H walking through the ghettos. They showed none of that. All they showed was Booker T winning the Battle Royal. And like they showed Booker T winning on Raw. So people may not remember this. Booker T actually beat Triple H clean. I think it was a tag team match. Whatever, Triple Threat or something. Booker T pinned Triple H clean in a non title match at Raw the week prior. So, one, Booker T got a win over one of the biggest stars in the company. Two, when that stuff happens the week before a big pay-per-view, usually the guy that gets the win the week before loses at the pay-per-view. Right. There was a lot of signs there. Now, they didn't completely throw away the storyline. Like, the commentary for this match was brutal. You had Jim Ross basically saying, oh, Booker T. Like, I get what they were trying to do. I understand, like, kind of defend some of the storyline aspects of this. Like, there's certain things you can't defend, like Triple H telling Booker T to dance and telling him he's got nappy hair and that guy should, a guy like that shouldn't be champion. I get that. Indefensible. But I get what they were trying to do at the crux. Because you had like Jim Ross painting this picture of Booker T as a guy who made mistakes as a young kid who was not born with the same privileges as Triple H and wound up going down a, a life of crime. And you got Jerry Lawler just being like, no, he's a thug. We don't want a thug being world heavyweight champion. I think that was the word. Let me see. I have, should have it noted. The word that Jerry Lawler used at nauseum. Let's see. Um, yeah, Jerry Lawler called Booker T a street thug multiple times. Oh, my during God. During this match. And, like, you got Jerry Lawler the whole time hammering home. Just saying phrase, like, I'm paraphrasing. Saying things like, criminal should not be world champion. Quote, street thug should not be in WrestleMania main event. Not be in the same ring with Ric Flair and Booker T. I mean, Ric Flair and Triple H. But then you had like Jim Ross, like, yeah, building him up, being like, yeah, this guy, yeah, he came from a life of crime, but he got his life together. He made it to this point at WrestleMania 19. He's going to be world champion. All that would have been fine and dandy if Booker T had won the match. Like, that'd be great. It would have been a great storyline. Booker T, this, this black male, he's being told by corporate America he's not good enough be the face of the company then in reality he's actually not good enough because he didn't win the match like it was just not a good storyline not a good outcome it had potential to be a really good storyline if booker t wins the match and you got jim ross saying oh booker t he was a criminal you got but you know jim ross crying booker t was a criminal now he's world champion at wrestlemania 19 he beat triple h that this would be an all-time great storyline that we're looking back fondly and it would arguably be enough but WrestleMania 19 in the conversation, like in a different conversation, as a standalone greatest WrestleMania ever. But because the storyline outcome was just, oh yeah, Booker T is really not good enough. He's black. He's not good enough to be beat the white champion. That was yeah, just indefensible. Yeah. Kevin, <clears throat> I just th- this is what Cody Rhodes thought he was doing with Anthony Ugogo. A double or nothing 2021. He thought he was ending races, setting race relations forward 50 years. WWE did like the opposite with this match. Like, I don't want to be retroactively offended because I, but I'm like watching this going, like, as you say, Booker T losing made this so much worse. If Booker T won, it's like Booker T overcame like literal racial discrimination throughout the whole build. And had this great WrestleMania moment that would have elevated him exponentially. But Triple H just won. And it's like, oh. So all that for Triple H just to win. So I was like, ah, really? Why? <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. the match was fine. <laughs> I, commentary was strange. Oh, you put it together really well. J- Jerry's commentary on this is cringe. I mean, listen to it now, 20 years later, it's a bit like, oh, I don't know about that. Like, I really don't know about that. But, and JR was really good. This is, once, I mean, JR has a lot of great work. This is some really good stuff from JR, 100%. Um, yeah, th- this was, 
controversial for a number of reasons. I, I do like the point you make as well, how they edited out most of the stuff with the like, you know, the Triple H and the, the racial stuff. They edited out a lot of that in the package, which I found very interesting. Even WWE, you know, editing it, they're probably going, uh, we probably shouldn't do this. Like, this doesn't, like, no, that they, they nixed it. So, yeah, just, yeah, a lot to digest with this match. Yeah, and the match was better than people would give it credit for. It's actually really good. This was like prime Triple H, prime Booker T. In ring, it was a good wrestling match. Like, it fit a WrestleMania. That good. It was like 18 minutes and 47 seconds long. And for, what, about 17 minutes and 50 seconds, it was a great match. Until you get to the ending. And the ending would have been fine. It would have been fine if you didn't have all the racial stuff with the build-up. If it had just been like, okay, Booker T is this WCW guy. He's not on Triple H's level because, you know, Vince hates WCW. That would have been a storyline. And Triple H, you know, Tri- Triple H pedigrees Booker T. He takes o- almost 30 seconds to pin him and wins. Fine. WCW is not on the level of WWE. That's great. Cool. But then you drag the racial stuff into it, it's like, why? What's that accomplish? Yeah, just... They could have done a great story without the racial side. It was just, you know, it was just an extra... It wasn't necessary. Um, and I guess, you know, we transitioned to the other match I was mentioning there with, with Vince and Shane, which is much the same in the sense of just some unnecessary stuff that goes along with it. Like there was just so much to this that a bunch of the, the really controversial stuff didn't need to happen. The the Trish barking like a dog segment, for instance, that didn't need to happen. Although Vince McMahon was already detestable enough, already sedated his wife, already beat up his own children as Shane McMahon, already Stephanie McMahon was an unlikable kind of co-act as daddy's little girl to Vince. So. Like, there was enough there, but they, they, they went over the top, which is the kind of theme with these two matches on comparative shows. W went over the top with this. Absolutely, pal. And, and I made a whole video on this. <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> oh, jeez. I made a whole video on this segment because the impact that this segment had on wrestling, I don't think a lot of people really understand just how detrimental. And when I say this segment, I mean the... Trish barking like a dog in the lead up to this match. People really don't understand how detrimental that was to WWE wrestling as a whole. If that was literally used in Congress against Linda McMahon when Linda McMahon was running to be senator, you had the the people that she was running against, the counterparts she's running for office against, pointing out this segment, like looking at this, like literally pausing it and saying, this is the owner of WWE treating a female employee like this on TV. And this is want his wife running this state. Crazy. It was unbelievable. And the, yeah, the aftermath immediately was, you know, people were outraged. Vince went on and did a Bob Costas interview. Bob Costas grilled Vince and slipped on call. Affected. And people were mad. I believe it was Canada or the United Kingdom edited this segment out of the show completely. Again, we're not showing that on TV. And it was another form of discrimination. And I get it. It's all characters. Just like how Triple H and Booker T were characters. It's McMahon and Linda and Trish. and They're all characters. But it, it's, it brings up the interesting point about wrestling where it's analyzed differently than any other form of entertainment. Mm. that's where the fine line is like people look at that they're like that feels real like women are really treated badly in corporate america and in, in instances not every corporation but you know we see plenty of stories where like powerful men take advantage of women in the workplace and you know we see that and here we're watching it play out on live tv it was weird this like this match is in shane I would say it was more detrimental to wrestling as a whole. Like on Twitter, people freak out more about Triple H and Booker T. It's kind of like within the wrestling community, it's kind of like a kind of big. But overall, in real in the real world, this match was more had more of a negative impact. And it's really crazy how like there's just there's like 
two big blemishes just right plastered on the canvas of both these great WrestleManias. Oh yeah, oh yeah, pal. Uh, yes, yeah. No, nah, I think both of them are blemishes in their own right, and uh, I feel like we could make separate podcasts on each one. That's how much there is here for like each of them. I mean, you made the video on the Trish barking like dogs and all the consequences and ramifications of that. That was only a small element of this, like not to mention the simulcast on literally the week before where WCW got purchased just casually, just ending the Monday Night War. You know, WCW wrestlers involved in this as well. Like that. There was just so much involved in this. There was so much involved in Triple H and Booker T. And uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I feel like we could go on for hours about this, but I don't know. For the, for the interest of the podcast, Kevin... Unless you want to say something else now, just feel free. We can loop back to that China and Ivory or whatever you want to talk about there. Yeah, I want to one. circle back to what preceded Triple H versus Booker T because I, I forgot that we had a little bit of a buffer. So I really like the way they booked the card in 19 where it was like, Don versus Jericho, that's the end of the mid-card matches. <clears throat> and then we got Limp Biscuit performing Crack Attic. And we got the WrestleMania cat fight. So we had like at least like 10-15 minutes worth of buffer before we got to the big matches. So Limp Biscuit. They perform the theme song of WrestleMania 19, which is called Crack Addict. And I thought that was interesting looking back 20 years in the, in the future. Looking back, or in the past, sorry, looking back at it 20 years in the past. The theme song is called Crack Addict. Just, I mean, interesting. Um, and if you listen to the lyrics, he's talking about cracking skulls. So he's addicted to cracking skulls, pal. Um, <laughs> which is interesting. They used this match in the build up for Rockin or the song in the build up for Rockin' Austin, similar to the way they used Biscuit My Way in 2017. They were both great build ups. Both the lyrics both made sense both ways. Um I thought the lyrics just hit home differently. The WrestleMania 19 build up, which we'll talk about. But nevertheless, Limp Biscuit's performance a crack addict. Nobody cared. Like the crowd was just sitting on their hands. They're like, we don't care about this guy. Why is he screaming? Like, okay. Uh, it did fit the flow of the show. I, I would like to see The Weeknd perform at a... The Weeknd's been the song sponsor for, what, like, for straight WrestleManias now? Can we get The Weeknd to perform? Can we get him out there just... Whatever. Save your tears or whatever they're using this year. Less than zero. Less than zero. Yeah. Yeah, can we get that? That would be fantastic. Kevin, Kevin The Weeknd is Mr. WrestleMania. Nowadays, <laughs> oh my god, like, there's no other. I mean, some would say Seth Rollins, but no, like, really, Mr. WrestleMania is the weekend. He's you know, like, those songs, Blinding Light, Save Your Tears, Sacrifice, now Less Than Zero, like, all really good songs, but it's they're, they're just so different to these songs to 17 and 19, like My Way, Crack Addicts, like, it's just it's a different tempo, it's just an all different vibe, and you More know, adults. like, I was in. More like adult in your face type of vibe. Yes, yes, yes. Which you know got over really well and justifiably so. And the songs now are more just family more friendly. neutral, more you know obviously family oriented, and that's the direction of the company. I can't complain there. Um, but yeah, no, like the, that performance. Yeah, I, I do. I do like the buffer that they said. Okay, the mid card stuff is done now. Let's get to the main events. That's literally what Double Fury told us at WrestleMania 19 without directly saying it. Like, and I don't want to talk about the WrestleMania cat fight. Wow. I've written in my notes for this one, too. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what the WrestleMania cat fight is, it was the Miller Lite girls taking on Casey Keebler and Tori Wilson. And they literally had a bed on stage. Like a Miller Lite-themed bed. For whatever reason, Jonathan Coachman's out there in his tidy whities That was not the highlight of the segment. but yeah. 2003 Tori Wilson? That is her absolute apex. Her absolute prime. The best she ever looked. Like she, 2003, she could have won the Brian Danielson Award for best technical wrestler, pal. Yes. She's up there with 09 Brian Danielson, just the absolute apex of technical wrestling. Um, this was peak Jerry Lawler freaking out when these girls, like, they take off their shirts and they're in their bra and panties. You got, like, Corey Wilson spanking Stacey Keebler. Um, and at one point, Jim Ross. His, he looks at Jerry Lawler like Jerry Lawler's freaking out about one of the Miller Lite cat, uh, cat fight girls and Jerry Lawler ah, and Jim Ross says D does she call you Uncle Jerry it's a line oh. of the night absolute line of the night 
That was fantastic. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to admit. I just I just wanted to talk about that for a moment. That WrestleMania cat fight. Uh, yeah. Wow. wow. That might be the highlight of this WrestleMania, pal. Yeah, I know. Intense work rate. Um, speaking of women's work rate, China and Ivory. Um, very different to the, the, the cat fight. Very different. Um, yeah. No, th- this was... It was one of these matches you couldn't look away just as the storyline was that China might break her neck again. So you're watching the match. Like, Ivory is half of China's size and probably has about one-fifth the strength of China. So it was a bit of a demolition job in that sense and ended up just being a, a two-minute, oh, China won the women's title back sort of match. But I don't know. Like, it, just, it had its place here. It was, you know, the great presentation of women's wrestling at WrestleMania 7, two-minute squash match like this and that was it um wrestlemania 19 definitely clears with just generally with the women's side of it i mean you had the the good match for the women's title at 19 you had the middle like cat fight girl stuff you had stacy keebler and tori wilson there like there was so much more there more digestible content there more work right there here was literally china coming down with a stiff neck walking like a robot and then just punching ivory for two minutes and winning the title it was it wasn't great it, it, this was another like little blemish on the show it didn't take too long it was only two minutes kevin so it wasn't like it didn't hurt the show that much it was just not just sort of there with this yeah the only thing i i note on this is that china looked like an absolute star her entrance and her presentation that, that yes yes Go on. i love the entrance like she's doing she's like got the confetti gun I, I, li- I liked it. Her theme song, everything was great. Commentary was great, building her. Yeah. Really much more I can add. Okay, I think that's the main events, I think. We're ready to talk about some big matches. Um, okay. Where do you want to start us off, pal? Lead us off. Um, let's see. Well, so we're looking at what came next after, after uh, Shane and Vince. And we're talking Shane. about Chelsea, too. In yeah, it was, was TLC too, and then what came after Triple H and Booker T was Hogan and Vince. Yeah, yeah, I think we should talk about TLC too before we get into Hogan. I have a lot to say on Hogan Vince. We might have to break this into two parts, pal. Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> look, I, I was going to say with TLC too. Um, th- th- this match is like everyone. Uh, people have reviewed this to death. They've analyzed what exactly happened. But it's, it's a match you just sort of have to watch. Like, you just, if you haven't seen TLC 2 by now, it happened 22 years ago, just do it. It's, it's 15 minutes. So it's not one of these New Japan hour and a half long matches. Like, it, it's, it's quick. It is high impact, beyond high impact. It, I mean, I say it's like a car crash and you literally can't look away. It, it, it's nine people putting their bodies through literal hell, falling off ladders, flying through tables all of it for the tag team titles. Like, like this makes this, so much like this makes the tag team title seem like the most legit, credible titles you could possibly want. And like nowadays, I know the Usos have held those titles for 600, 650, 700 days, but they're just nowhere near as important. I don't care that they're on main eventers. A match like this does more for the tag titles than a 650 day Uso run does. Like a match like this, I mean, look at the stars involved. Oh, Edge and Christian, the Dudleys, the Hardy Boys, the names, the quality of the match. Like, Kevin, I'll throw it to you because I could just, you know, praise this for half an hour. Just what were your thoughts when you watched this? Uh, this is a, a top 15 wrestling match of all time, undoubtedly, objectively. It, both these shows have top 15 matches. You had Don and Jericho, and you had this TLC too. This is one of the most famous matches in the history of wrestling. You got that clip of. Edge uh, spearing Jeff Hardy from the top of the ladder. Jeff Hardy's holding on to the belts. He's got no, like the ladder got removed by Bubba Ray Dudley. He's just dangling with the belts. Edge spears him. That's the clip that's going to live on forever. It's going to be played at the beginning of WWE shows until the end of time. These six guys all got famous off of this match. They became household names off of this match. Edge and Jeff Hardy went on to have the best singles career. Matt Hardy and Christian went on to have pretty good singles careers. Bubba Ray Dudley had a pretty good singles career in TNA and still on Indies. He does a lot of stuff. A lot of media stuff, podcasts, whatever. Yvonne, 
didn't have the great single career that the other guys had, but still went on to be a backstage agent. We still see him in backstage segments nowadays, apart, stuff like that. All six of these guys went on to be. And that's something that has never been done before since. I think it'll ever happen again. Like the star power that was created from this. You know, the build up for this match, it was what it was. Um, yeah, it was what it was, but nevertheless, yeah, an all time great match. Not not much more I can add. Well, Kevin, I think we I I know a match like this with Vince and Hogan, this is a match that it just it feels like it's made for you to analyze. Something like this. Yeah. Um uh, you said you took detailed notes. I'm just gonna throw it right to you. What what were your brutally honest thoughts? What were your notes watching a match that was Press WrestleMania 19 was built around. What were your thoughts? Pal, this was... Watching this, it was truly like watching the beginning of wrestling just implode. Like, the beginning of what I knew wrestling was as a kid. Like, I always knew Hogan, Vince, WrestleMania. Like, that's why we watch WWE nowadays. And now these guys hate each other. It was really, like, surreal, you know? Uh, The promo package was fantastic for this match this is one of the most well built from a storyline perspective one of the most well built up wrestlemania matches ever the storyline behind this was just so personal so many layers you had vince like making hogan bleed making hogan sign the contract for the match with his own blood just fantastic (coughs) this this was hulk hogan's last great match (coughs) i know he wrestled a couple times he wrestled sean at SummerSlam 05, he wrestled Orton, SummerSlam 06. But this was Hogan's last great match in wrestling. Just, we saw so much crazy stuff. The unprotected chair shot that Vince took from Hogan. Oh my god. Oh my god, pal. That was scary, watching that. With everything we know about CTE, chair shots, and all things we know 20 years later. That was terrifying to see. Um... Vince doing the leg drop off the ladder. I mean, Vince, Vince can have a good match when he wants to, pal. Like, this is prime jacked Vince McMahon on the gas, pal. This is the all-time most jacked Vince ever looked at this match. He literally can barely even walk. He's so jacked. <laughs> He's got, like, a jail body. His arms are, like, 27 inches wide. His chest is, like... <laughs> He's got... The, he, I don't even know what you, could, what you could describe his chest as. Chest is gigantic. Bro, this was nuts. I love this match. I love it. I don't know if you could tell, but I love this match. I love when Piper yeah, came in. Better... Go oh, sorry, go on. Go on. Good, good. Who's the better in-ring wrestler, Vince McMahon or Bray Wyatt? Oh, Vince McMahon. Yeah, W. W. Carry on. Carry on. Yeah, I love when Piper comes in and Piper just like spits on Vince. <laughs> and then he hits Hogan with the pipe. Fantastic. Yeah. Then the last thing I want to say... Hulk Hogan is a damn good seller. Like, people say Ziggler is, like, a great seller. Hogan puts Ziggler to shit. When Vince leg-dropped Hogan, go back and watch it. Hogan starts having a seizure. <laughs> like, come on. Bro. Vince has, one point, Vince has Hogan in, like, an elbow lock, and Hogan's like, oh, my God. Oh, I don't know if I could, I could hang on. Like, he's just, like, screaming in agony, yelling at the ref. Brother! Ah! It's great. <laughs> Great. This match was fantastic. The build-up was just ridiculous. This was like two men on steroids arguing about money and like who's like who's better all the time. Like who like like Vince is like I created wrestling. Hogan's like, no, I created WrestleMania. Like that was literally the story. It was so good. Go back and watch it. I know it's Hogan, I know it's Vince, I know Hogan's racist and Vince is an evil billionaire. But I don't give a damn about their personal lives. All that mattered to me is what they did in the ring. And this match was so, was so good. Yeah. No, I'm it, the it same as you. I, I love this. Like, I, <laughs> I don't honestly have much more to add than you've just put, but I just, it's so fun. Because, yeah, obviously, their you know, <laughs> personal lives, what have you, I don't care. Just the storyline, the match, the presentation, the Piper stuff I loved. I love the way Roddy Piper comes down and does what he did with the spitting and he's like he's getting on the grill with both of them. It's just it's just a great fun match. Like this is this is 
probably, to me at least, this was the funnest match of WrestleMania 19. Um, it was just so entertaining. And that's, what, I mean, that's why we watch. Um, it was just, this was so entertaining to watch. Just the two guys involved, the story, all of it. Um, they couldn't have asked for much more, especially considering the, the in-ring ability, you know, of the two that they absolutely, I mean, that, did, did they steal the shot? I mean, there are other matches, like Michael's and a better match, obviously, but in the sense of who was involved, the story, it's hard to go past this. This was just, this was show stealing in some way, Kevin. Yeah, it was fantastic. Go back and watch Vince eat that unprotected chair shot to the head. That is like, wow. Kevin, would you blame how bad WWE was over the last decade on that <laughs> chair shot? Maybe. You have a legitimate beef, pal, for that. Um, pal, that chair shot caused Keith Lee to become the bear cat. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, wow. Pal, let, let's Ooh. analyze... I guess we, we could cut it here, then we'll finish recording later. But let's analyze um, The Rock and Austin's respective matches at both of these shows. It, it, it was supposed to be the main event for 19. We all know the famous story. Austin almost had a heart attack. So WWE was like, yeah, we probably shouldn't have a main event. And you can kind of yeah. see it. Austin just looks sick, looks pale. But he went through, he got through the match. <clears throat> it's crazy. This, on this WrestleMania, you had a guy nearly have a heart attack and die the night before. Had Kurt Angle break his neck like two weeks before. Crazy. Whatever. But yeah. So Austin Rock 17 versus Austin Rock for Wrestle. Which do you think is better? Uh, 17. 17. Uh, but uh, this is the thing, right? Because of the end. Better, I can. I, I understand. Yeah, can like, you say I, that again? I, you, you cut out. Oh, sorry. Uh, 17 was better. But because of the ending to 17, if people are saying 19 was better. I get it, you know, if that makes sense. Like, if people are just so, you know, just hate the ending of 17 and want to say 19 is better, fair. Um, to me, 17 just had more spectacle to it. The storyline was better. Both guys were primed in that sense. They were, you know, at their apex, really. Like, at this point, The Rock, from his, like, mic work standpoint, was never better than 2003. I feel like he was just at his apex, as we mentioned with the promo earlier. And Austin was sort of just barely hanging on because he was you know, sick, the, the medical type stuff that was happening at the time in 03. Um, but 01 was these guys just going at it. It was like, the, to make a modern a- analogy for any sports fans listening, it was like the 2016 Cavs and Warriors with WrestleMania 17. It was both of them at their best. It, it just clicked. It worked. It was you know the best they'll be going at it. And then WrestleMania 19 was basically the, the 2018 version where, like, Austin's LeBron, he's barely hanging on. He's still a legend, but, like, he just – there's not enough to work with there. And The Rock's Golden State, he's just way too good. That's sort of sort of how I felt watching 19. Um, the Rock is just – was so far clear by that point. Austin was, you know, a shell of himself almost. He still put his act on. It was still really good. It wasn't a bad match at all, but – yeah, 17 is just a great main event, in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think WrestleMania 19 is better from an in-ring standpoint. Uh, I think Rock was at his absolute prime. 2003 era. From, like, an in-ring shape standpoint, ring ability. He, he's obviously, he's not as, he wasn't as muscular as he would go on. Um, tens and, I'm sorry, the 2010s and naturally so naturally of course yeah, yeah this i think this was rock's like absolute peak physique wrestler like he wasn't too big and he was just in perfect shape right here he was about to go to hollywood i think i like to I like what you said about austin it's it's kind of obvious you could tell that that rock was carrying austin you could see that austin from a physical standpoint was broken down the neck injury the knee injury everything had caught up to him and you could just kind of tell, like, knowing that he was going to retire, you could see it, that he didn't have the same amount of movement. But with that being said, I still think that they had a great match. I still think that it was better than 17. I just, I, I could, it's easier to watch. You know? And I think a part of it is because of the ending, 17 too. I just thought yeah. this match was easier to watch. It was more simplistic. Just went in, we're punching, side of the rings. No Vince McMahon out there. No chair shots. Nothing like that. It was just a straight-up wrestling match. 
I love the commentary. I love like Jim Ross just hammering the point that like the referees allowing stuff that they wouldn't allow because it's Austin Rock. They don't get in the way of this, this big match. Yeah, I, I really like that the, the kind of storytelling. This was also <clears throat> Jerry Lawler again. Jerry Lawler at his absolute apex as a commentator. I don't think he was better than he ever, than he ever was. I think this was Jerry Lawler's singular best performance at at a show. He was just doing the like the cheesy heel stuff for Rock. It's like, oh, Austin, don't hurt Rock. Oh, Austin, Rock got to protect his face. He's got to go to Hollywood. Like, just great stuff. Um, let's see what else? What else did I have here? Oh, and the ending. The ending was so good. And you have like Rocky hits the third rock bottom. Finally, puts Stone Cold away. Finally, beats him. Then he's just like he's sitting there on in the apron. He's soaking it all in because he knows it's Austin's last match. Like he's pushing away the ref. He's like talking to Austin. I forgot what he said. I know he spoke about it in an interview. He said some things to Austin. He was just like, "Thank you for sharing the ring with me. this. Thank you for everything." Yeah. It, you could feel the emotion, you know? and that emotion I think means something. Cause that's I feel like like that's what we watch wrestling for. For that emotion, that investment. Again, this was cinema, pal. It, 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 this guy, The Rock, ended up going to be a biggest actor in Hollywood. Not long after this, this is true cinema. I don't want to yeah. hear anything about Jimmy Uso or Jay Uso hugging Sami Zayn, pal. The Rock telling Stone Cold Steve Austin, "Thank you for a great career." As Austin's about to have his last match, and Rock's about to ride off in Hollywood. That is true cinema wrestling match. It was great. It was like everything about this was just fantastic. Hundred percent. No, I, you, you said, said that really well. I yeah, I, I think because seventeen's they're so different because like the stages of their career. It was only. But I mean, two years in wrestling is a damn long time. So, yeah, you look at like where Austin was at 17. He was, you know, well, you'd say Austin's apex was really 98 or 99, to be honest. But 01 was him perhaps peaking again. And then you come to 03 and he's clearly not the same. It, you know, he, he looked paler, as you say. And I don't know, you, Rock's just excellent. I mean, both guys are excellent. They're these absolute all-time great Mount Rushmore guys. And... What I want to say about this, which is just a general kind of point, I love with these WrestleManias, these shows actually feel like the showcase of the Immortals just because of the talent involved, how how big the stars were. And with a match like this, you, you're like you're three and a half hours into the shows, you're seeing The Rock and Stone Cold like wrestling each other. Like that, that's WrestleMania to me. Yes. Like that, like that is the definition of everything WrestleMania is about <laughs> seeing these guys do their thing. Like these are just like some of the best to ever do it. And getting to watch them do this, even, I mean, this was, you know, 21 years ago and, you know, 20 years ago, respectively, like this, this is two decades ago, but even watching it back, you go like, these guys are just the best to do it sort of thing. Absolutely. So. I want to talk about the, the promo packages. Both of these matches. <clears throat> yeah. The WrestleMania 17 promo package with Rocket Austin, I think it's the greatest promo package ever for any match. Do you agree? My way, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. Like that, I get chills anytime I watch that that promo package. It, the lyrics fit. Everything fit. It just it made sense. Um, and then the same thing with 19. The, the promo package, the lyrics, everything made sense. It, it it felt big time, and again, like we say, we don't see this very often. Yeah, it just it felt big time. Hundred percent, no, hundred percent. I think, yeah, entrances. I like with seventeen the the whole like do anything it takes to win. I know the ending that led to people hate with the Vince handshake, and I get so it bad. to do, but the story of Austin. Doing like desperate to do anything he can to just just win that title. I I liked it personally. All right, so to circle back, um, and we got to talk about Mister McMahon versus Shane McMahon just for a minute. I know we spoke a lot about that in great detail, but we would mm-hmm. be absolutely awful at our jobs as legitimate, credible wrestling journalists slash media personalities if I didn't ask you. Like, what, what would you think? Like, what would be the reaction if in 2023 they did this Mr. McMahon and Trish Stratus angle where Mr. McMahon made Trish Stratus bark like a dog? 
Kevin, you'd have CNN, you'd have Fox News, you have MSNBC, you'd have ABC, Jimmy Kimmel will be covering this. This will be getting mainstream raps. Like, oh, yeah, Vince McMahon be the hottest interview in wrestling. Like, Fox News would be desperate to get him on for a, an interview. And you'd have... And next like, to Tyrus, pal. Oh, don't, let's not go there, pal. I, I need to burst a blood vessel again. But yeah, like, this, Kevin, this would be earth shattering if something like this happened with like the Trish Barkley dog segment like Kevin in 01 when this happened I mean as we discussed Vince got hate on Bob Costas for it but compared to what would happen nowadays it'd be like the world would be ending you'd have people showing up outside WEHQ trying to burn the place down you know it'd be uproar Kevin it would be absolute uproar and what if Triple H buried Booker T and WWE used that racially inclined or I don't know if it clans the right word, but racially fused storyline that they use for Triple H versus Booker T leading up to WrestleMania 19. Very similar. Very similar. You have Fox News desperate to get Triple H on for an interview. You have you know, Booker T will be going on MSNBC talking about how he's being racially vilified and all this. You have like the absolute uproar on social media, outrage. Like Kevin, I like that you're hinting at this. The climate today with what we're discussing with the 17 and 19 shows, society wouldn't be able to just at all cope with the idea of it, let alone WWE doing it. Like, I just honestly, Kevin, nuts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in my opinion, um, I think the WrestleMania 17 stuff with Vince and Trish, I think that would be worse by like a large margin. Yeah. Like, I, I think... You know, I, I could just see, like, the Triple H of Booker T storyline. I could see some people going crazy to defend it, you know? Mm. But there would be little to no defending the, the Vince and Trish from any angle, you know? It would be just horrific backlash. I, honestly, I, if they did that, some of that stuff today in 2023, I, I don't want to say there would be no WWE, but people would be pushing real hard. Like, you'd have, like, rallies in Congress to get WWE thrown off of like major broadcast television, it it, it, would, it would be a war politically. Oh, it would be an absolute car crash from the sponsors' perspective, the publicity, PR, and uh, WWE can thank their lucky stars. Social media wasn't a thing in two thousand and one, because if it was, that would have been the end of them with that sort of content, with the Vince and Trish, with the sedated wife Linda. With Stephanie McMahon's daddy's girl, like jumpsuit at WrestleMania 17, with Vince beating, beating his child, Shane McMahon, all this, like, oh my god, all of that in one storyline, pal. Yeah, and I want to say this too. I rewatched Shane versus Vince since we last spoke. Oh my god, bro! Like that was like a little intro that Shane does. First of all, how often do we see this where a wrestler comes out in WrestleMania? grabs the live mic and cuts a promo before a match like it's very rare shane grabs the mic so i was cutting this promo about how there's wcw talent in the crowd and then he's like what's up boys and he like points to the like they're way up in the nosebleeds yeah in, in, in like a, in a skybox in a private suite the camera can't even pan to them <laughs> camera can't literally can't even zoom that far so then they cut back to shane and it's like this awkward pause and then they cut back with a better camera angle of the of the the quote wcw wrestlers but that's literally the graphic that we see on the screen it literally just says wcw wrestlers the only person i could recognize was stacy keebler of the yeah. group of jobbers that they showed like the way that that you would think like okay this is the biggest wrestlemania of all time this is shane mcmahon out there vince just purchased wcw they're running this big big angle you would think they have like Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Hulk Hogan, Goldberg, you know, Jeff Jarrett. You'd think Booker T's in the crowd, Scott Steiner. But no, it's Stacey yeah. Keebler and some jobbers. Kevin, <laughs> we're, we're definitely doing a podcast on this, whether it's later this year or next year, whenever. Just about that invasion, that whole situation that went down with that storyline. I know Vince Russo pitched this to Vince McMahon and the whole board when 2001, that he was going to come in, they're going to do a big time storyline, a long, slow burn, Eric Bischoff being Vince McMahon's like, you know, like understudy almost, Shane getting pissed off, like bring in all the big name WCW guys is this big deal. That would have been great, Kevin. But instead what we got was this. We got 
like Buff Bagwell and Stacey Keebler and some nosebleed skybox. You couldn't even see it. They botched the camera angle and Shane McMahon was trying to hype it up. And it's like, bruh, this is WrestleMania 17, for God's sake. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, all right, pal. Now it's the time. Uh, we we spoke about the main event of WrestleMania 17 and we spoke about Austin Rock for WrestleMania 19. Yeah. So now it's time to speak about... Realistically, we, we did Austin Rock as one because that was supposed to be the main event of 19. Mm-hmm. So we'll speak about Triple H versus Undertaker, WrestleMania 17. And then we can speak about um, the main event of 19, Brock versus Kurt. Yeah. I, I've watched both matches recently, so they're fresh in my mind. I, I, I think, like, realistically, that either one of these matches could have main evented any WrestleMania. Like, that, like Triple H and Taker... This wasn't even their best match of the three matches they had. This was like, in terms of quality, I mean, it was a good match. You know, it fit the, the storyline or I, I lack thereof a storyline. For that, with that being said, like, they still wrestled pretty well. Oh, the storyline was so bad, bro. Like, jeez, you have Kane kidnapping Stephanie McMahon, threatening to throw her off this, like, <laughs> balcony. Like, throw her 10 feet to her death unless William Regal gave Undertaker a match with Triple H. Like, what? Kevin, think you're, Steph- you're Stephanie McMahon. It's March 2001. You are all over the show. You're wearing daddy's girl jumpsuits as your father beats up your own brother, and, you know, as your mother is sedated watching. you got your father getting major heat for making Trish bark like a dog. You're, about- you're threatening to be throw- thrown off a balcony. Like... Stephanie McMahon in 2001 was a menace, pal. Just <laughs> simply yeah. put. But no, like this, yeah, the, the build was eh. Awful. I mean, it was the worst of their three WrestleMania matches by far. But even still, it was a, you know, on most other WrestleManias, this is the main event. That's the quality of the wrestlers involved. This is Triple H. I mean, Triple H's prime was, like Triple H had, had a long prime from like 99 through, I mean, you can say like, you know, 2010 sort of thing like triple h for most of the 2000s was just like a big main event deal so a big time star in triple h and then the undertaker who's the undertaker so yeah like this match was enjoyable it was a fun watch it went for what 20 odd minutes it didn't outside its welcome there was some fun spot in it, spots in it commentary was excellent again and um, we discussed this earlier and don't want to beat a, a drum too much but yeah Heyman and jim ross did a great job here just you know fun match kevin what, what were your thoughts on it i thought it was good I wouldn't say that it was like a great match or anything. It, it was kind of hard to watch this one because this was sandwiched in between TLC two and Austin Rock. So this is like, yeah, like I'm into it as Triple H and Undertaker. But after watching the video package where Kane is literally about to throw Stephanie McMahon off that ledge, I, I just I wasn't really that interested in it. Like, why is it that serious? <laughs> I, I thought the storyline was supposed to be okay, this is Triple H's yard or whatever, my world, and this is Undertaker's yard. Literally, I thought it was supposed to be, okay, this is who is the best wrestler in the company, right? Like, that's what I would take it as, the best, like, in-ring, bell-to-bell, best alpha dog. But no, then we got Kane threatening to throw Stephanie McMahon off a ledge, so it kind of took me out of, like, the match, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I, we had yeah. a, I, you know, we just watched the, arguably a top fifteen match of all time in the TLC two. Then I'm like, okay, this is what we got here. So I mean, it was good. It was fine and dandy. Nothing really to, to write home about. Anything else you want to say about it? Um, no, not really. I just want to just throw in one more time how cool these two guys are. Like Triple H and O one here is just such. He's such a G. Like he's you know jacked on steroids. He's got like the the, the vest, not the vest, but he's. he's like his attire for the entrance and just generally his overall aesthetic was so dope. And same with the Undertaker. Like some people hated the the biker taker. I liked it. I don't think it was as good as Ministry Taker, but I thought this was still, you know, Mark Calloway doing a doing a good job. So yeah, no, a good match, but nothing to write home about. And yeah, the build was odd. Really yeah, these odd. guys are clear big stars too. The Undertaker gets the big entrance, Triple H has motorhead playing him to the ring. These guys are clear big stars. It's a big fight feel. And it's just casually, like, sandwiched in the middle of the car. Like, they just had Vince McMahon, rather, not they. Vince McMahon had no plans for either one of these guys to wrestle me. He's just like, Hunter, you're going to wrestle Mark, pal. <coughs> and here we are. Nevertheless, yeah. we move on. So 
So the main event of WrestleMania 19 was Brock Lesnar versus Kurt Angle. Th- this match is really just it's kind of crazy. It's kind of like it shows just how much of a circus or just how wild wrestling can be. Kurt Angle wrestled this match shortly after suffering a broken neck. I think it was like three, four weeks before the match. Like it, he didn't even know if he was going to wrestle on this show. Brock Lesnar gets concussed. And if it was any other man besides somebody as thick and built as Brock Lesnar, they would have been dead from the botched shooting star press or had a broken neck or paralyzed. He just casually gets the concussion. Has no idea where he's at. Like you can see it too at the end of the match when Kurt goes to hug him. Brock is not there. Like Brock is just like staring off into the sun. He's got that dazed look in his eyes. Yeah. It, it was tough to watch. The ending was tough to watch. Um, knowing that Kurt Angle had the broken neck, watching this 20 years later, and knowing what we know about his like painkiller addiction that he went through, it's kind of hard to watch that, too, with, with that all that knowledge. Uh, putting all that stuff aside, I thought this was a good match. Like Considering everything that I just said, yeah. these two guys wrestled a damn good in-ring match. Yeah, pal. I can say my main takeaway from this was like I'm watching it going, these are, I think like at the time, your 2003 Kurt Angle and, you know, broken neck aside, 03 Angle versus 03 Brock, they're in their mid 20s, both of them, or Angle's like late 20s. These are two of the actual legitimate best athletes in the world, you know, and it's not just. Oh, they're like they're just you know in wrestling. And these are legitimately some of the best athletes in the world. Brock in 03, I mean Brock generally is nuts. We know that, but like this 03 Brock was just. Was, I didn't even know he was human. <laughs> he's just incredible. And Angle is a different. He's just a, a different breed of human. So this match for the first half of it, I was just kind of not in awe, but like just watching with appreciation of just how insane both of these guys are from like a physical point of view and aesthetic athletically all that sort of thing and the first half of the match was solid you know it wasn't like the, the greatest thing but it wasn't bad at all it was entertaining and then you get to the the last half of this match they, they get the finishes involved and there, there's the big one you mentioned there the bot shooting star press which is just so uncomfortable to watch still to this day i mean as you allude to if daniel bryan did that for instance let's say that happens wrestlemania 30 bryan's killed in the ring on the spot but brock because of like the construction of his neck, <laughs> how massive his traps and the, like the, the muscles near the neck are and the upper back. It, it was just, it was like a day's like clear concussion. It wasn't like he died on the spot, thank God. So yeah, there was, what, what a match. Like just the, the quality of the athletes involved. I love that they put actual full timers at the time, like upcoming full timers from SmackDown in the main event. I really did like that. So yeah, I, I have no real negatives to say about this outside of the obvious ending, which was uncomfortable. Yeah, that was ooh, tough to watch. And w- one thing I noted was this. Um, bro, if you go back and watch it, Brock picks up Kurt Angle for an F5 after the boss shooting Star Plus. Like, how? Like, how does he do that? <laughs> it's incredible. It's absolutely one of the most infamous matches. And it's always going to be remembered for that Brock shooting Star Press. Thank God he's never attempted another one because it definitely clearly is not his thing. But, man, with pal. that being said, pal, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, pal, these, these are two primal athletes in their prime doing battle over the WWE Championship. Great stuff. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, this is what the WWE Championship title match at WrestleMania is supposed to be. Oh, and I want to throw this in, too. Kurt Angle, he was 36 when this match went down. Really? Yeah. I watched it and thought he he looked like he's in his mid twenties. He looked in in phenomenal condition. I would yeah. I genuinely didn't guess that. Thirty six. Yeah, it's all the perks, pal. He wasn't eating. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, pal. Okay, <laughs> anyway, carry on. Carry on. <clears throat> all right. So we've talked about both of these shows. WrestleMania seventeen nineteen. We went through both the cards in full. Now, where do we go from here? I, do I ask you the generic question of oh, which one is better, or do we? Just do a general summary. Like, what, what do we do, pal? Um, I'd say we, we <coughs> give our, you know, you know, our opinion, which one was better, and then we can just kind of discuss maybe a couple of other, any, any other takeaways we have or just any other reasons why both these shows were so much better than stuff we get today. I think for me, when I watched them both, I preferred 17. 
I just think, as I alluded to earlier, the flow of 17 was is the greatest flow of any wrestling show I've ever watched. It just, it was so seamless. Yes, there was some stuff which you'll get it on paper and go, really, a three a three minute six man tag match, really? Or, or China Ivory for two minutes, really? Like, from that perspective, there's probably been better shows as far as like star ratings of matches, match by match. But the flow of 17 was just incredible. 19, I love the fact that it went the first four matches and then you went big match, big match, big match, big match, big match. I love that that's so unique to WrestleMania 19. No other show I can think of is like that, where it just it goes main event match, main event match, main event match, and you can't look away for the last two and a half hours. I love that. Um, so, so yeah, Kevin, overall, my opinion, obviously both are the best WrestleManias ever. Uh, if you spend four hours watching either, you're not going to regret it. Um, personally, I prefer 17, 19 is a close second, and then we can debate some other time, three through 38 from there, but... Yeah. What were your thoughts, pal? What was your opinion? Which one did you prefer, pal? Pal, before I answer that question, I just have a fun fact for you. WrestleMania 19 was a nine-match card. 2022's NWA Hard Times 3 had 16 matches, pal, including four pre-show matches. So put that in perspective, pal. Look, look at how we've devolved in this business. The greatest, arguably the greatest WrestleMania pay-per-view ever. Had only nine matches, but we got a nine or I'm sorry, a 16 match card in honor of Dusty Rhodes headlined by Tyrus and Matt Cardona and Trevor Murdoch. That is disgusting. But why can't WrestleMania or not WrestleMania? Why can't big pay-per-views, big matches, big shows have eight to ten matches or six to ten matches that matter? But why do we need 16 matches, pal, on NWA Hard Times 3? I digress. I digress. Uh, I I think WrestleMania 19 is better. That that's just me personally. Um, one thing I didn't like a critique about 17. How do you not have anything creatively for Triple H and Undertaker and Kurt Angle and Benoit? That's a critique to the management. But then the guys involved, Kurt Angle Benoit, they literally they're feuding because Chris Benoit wanted to put a. Triple crossface on Kurt Angle. Yeah. And Triple H and Taker are feuding because Kane tried to kill Triple H's wife. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, how do we not have anything better for these guys? And credit to the wrestlers, they made it work. And they went in, they had two damn good in ring matches. I, I just, I, what I'm saying in a long form is I appreciated how damn near every match on WrestleMania 19 had a story. Like, even Team Angle and <laughs> Los Guerreros, those guys, they had a storyline going involved. You know, the only thing that really didn't have a storyline was Matt Hardy and Rey Mysterio and Taker and Big Show and A Train. Yeah, I was going to say. I was going to say. You know, and aside yeah. from Nathan Jones, I guess coming to the aid of Mark Calloway, I, I guess that's a storyline. And, and Australian criminal running out there to help Mark Calloway, pal. Hell, the Colossus from Bogger Road made his impact known at WrestleMania XIX, but carry on. Yeah, isn't that phenomenal? Yeah, I, I just, I liked how 19 was more straight to the point and every big match felt like a big match. Like, I, I think the fact that Triple H and Taker had two matches that are in another galaxy, like, WrestleMania, their WrestleMania 17 match is, like, forgotten about in long, like, in the long-term history. I think that says something to like what the point here i'm trying to convey <clears throat> and I, I know wrestlemania 19 has the big stain of triple h absolutely burying booker t yeah but nobody cared about that at the time nobody cared like there might wow. have been some people that were watching that like ooh, you know that that segment may have not have been that good but people didn't really care like now everybody looks at it like 20 years later and they get upset about it but Booker T himself said he didn't care. Like, Booker T was just like, give me the check, pal. That's all I care yeah. about. So if Booker T don't care, why, why would I care? You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Does that well, make Kevin, sense? I think, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I think to me, the, the, the only, like, the things WrestleMania 19 and stop it from being number one, it's, it's four things. And I'll, I'll list them. Take a spot on the show. Mm-hmm which that's egregious. Like I get, I understand your point with the Triple H and Undertaker match at 17 placement, 
story, not the best. I get it. Um, but as far as the Undertaker match at WrestleMania, it, it beats Undertaker in a 1v2 handicap match against Lord Tensai and Big Show Lord with Tensai. Nathan Jones involved. Um, so Taker's <laughs> spot won uh, the botched ending of the main event, which was just a bit uncomfortable. Like I get it. The ending of 17 was hardly incredible in many people's eyes either for different reasons. Um, but at least the WrestleMania 17 ending didn't nearly have the youngest star in wrestling, the brightest star, break his neck and end his career. So that's two. Uh, the health of Steve Austin at 19 is another one. Um, if that was Steve Austin, you know, his health from two, four, six years prior, then I'm you know, more invested. But obviously, Austin just had to get through the match, as we discussed. And then number four is Booker T, which we just laid out. So to me, those are four little kind of stains of varying degrees for 19. Um, and to me, 17, it's really, you know, the ending, which is debatable. Um, Vince McMahon and the heel turn. Some people detest it. I don't mind it. I understand the context of what they were trying to go for. I don't, I don't think it was the right decision personally, but I got what they were going for. And that was really my only major gripe from the show. So outside of the storyline with Vince and Trish and that, but yeah. yeah. I, I think that's the last big point that we didn't really hit on is the ending of WrestleMania yeah. 17. That's one of those things where it, it, it becomes bad when you look at where the whole story went. Mm -hmm. Like in the moment, Austin shaking Vince's hand, undoubtedly, well, that's part of it too. It pissed people off in a way where they were like, I don't want to watch wrestling anymore. You know, everybody wanted to cheer Stone Cold. And this is just, like, me going back, reading forums, looking at, like, people talking about this match, like, with years in hindsight. People that used to be wrestling fans or, or really jaded wrestling fans giving their opinion on the match and on the show. You have the biggest star in wrestling who's an anti-hero that nobody wanted to see turn heel. <coughs> nobody. Because he was already a heel. When Vince and Austin shake hands, Austin turns into cookie cutter heel. Like yeah. he was literally generic heel 101. It was, he wasn't doing anything captivating. He was pretty much going away from the formula that worked. And that was him being himself, being unique, being unlike anything we'd seen in wrestling. At that point in 2001, we had already seen multiple heel stone cold steve austin characters we had seen characters with that elk many times guys that were chicken shit guys that were aligned with the booker or the promoter or the boss we've been there done that it wasn't unique and it, like i said it made people not want to watch but then in totality when you look at where that angle went the invasion angle is the most botched angle arguably in the history of wrestling yes and and that's in large part due to you know, WWE not having the big stars of WCW and then having Steve Austin like basically be the face of WCW, like what? Oh, like it was just bad. yeah, if you look at it through a lens and you look at it, okay, Austin telling the story, Austin will do whatever it takes to win the belt. Like you laid yeah. out already. Austin will do whatever it takes. That's a good story for one night. And but then like the next night on Raw, if Austin comes out it's like, yeah, I used you, Vince. Ha, you thought we had a deal. Stuns him, beats his ass, throws him, like, whatever. Throws him over a bridge, whatever you want to do. <laughs> then it would be great, you know? It would, that would be fantastic. It would have worked so much better. But because the heel turn led to a legitimate heel turn, and we got yeah. eight months of cookie-cutter Austin that nobody wanted to see, and <clears throat> you say Cena drove fans away in droves? Heel Stone Cold. Drove pro arguably, I, I think I don't want to look into this, but I think heels Austin drove just as much, if not more, than prime PG Arasina. I will say just before uh, I don't even know if I'll address that because I, I want to look at the numbers before I make any comment on that. What you've just said there, but the thing it's so obvious when I watch this show, watch the ending of seventeen, Austin uses Vince to beat the Rock because he he does whatever it takes, even relying on the guy he's feuded with for years in the most like hated greatest wrestling feud ever austin's used vince they shake hands i'd keep that and then right after as, as jr is screaming oh but he's shaking hands and something and so when he's like screaming i'd have austin stun vince and then the show just like like that it just it seems obvious that that's what they should have done 
But instead, they literally went off the air with Austin trying to flip off his home crowd and the home, the home crowd cheering him. And then we proceeded to get months and months of Steve Austin leading WCW in the fight against the evil Rock, Kurt Angle, and the WWF. It was it was so weird. It was bizarre. Like I think I stand by this. If Vince Russo was booking this, it would not have been nowhere near as convoluted and bad. It, Kevin, I agree with much of that statement. Heel Austin and the aftermath of 17 was a disaster, which I guess you can maybe put as a knock on 17, but as, as an actual just four-hour show, I think 17 was damn near fours. All right, pal. I got numbers here to back up what I just said. And again, I didn't state facts. I'm just saying I, I, you, I think. I was yeah. going off a hunch. <laughs> All right, so this is Raw in March of 2001. This is all the build up to. Let's see, hold up. All right, build the, up to WrestleMania 17. On, yeah, this is on the build up to WrestleMania 17. This is the March 4th episode of Raw. Did a 4.5. So, how many? So, that's what? 7 six, million. 7 million viewers? 7 million. 7 million. So, mm-hmm. based on that, so that does about 4.5, 7 million. I'd expect. Like what, what kind of figure are we going to pull out here? What, what month are we going to use? Now we're looking at, let's see, we're looking at the summer of 01. This is in the middle of Heel Austin. Uh-huh. WWE is doing the lowest numbers that they've done. Let me guess. Let me guess. Before you state it. Yeah. So if in leading into WrestleMania with all this build, you got babyface Austin challenging The Rock. That does, you said 4.5 and about 7 million viewers. Yeah. I think this one will be doing probably high, like 3.9, so like low sixes, sixes somewhere. Yeah, 4.1. Okay. 4.1 wow. in the heart of the summer. And then we're looking at 02. So we're, we're looking at a full year removed from Heel Austin and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah by 02, it's down 3.91. Oh. So this, that's stage, May of... That's May of 02. Oh. On the build to WrestleMania in 02, they're doing 4.5, 5.3, 4.8. Mm. So numbers are pretty pretty good. Naturally, with the uh, Rock Rock and Hogan, I assume, is what's um, pulling that number yep. up. And then here, for context, now we've got March of 2011. Oh, God, here we go. This is prime apex of Cena. March the March thirteenth, two thousand eleven episode of Raw did a three point nine two, five point yeah. seven eight million fans. Yeah, yep. So, I mean, we're just looking at like a surface level, but yeah, <laughs> the aftermath of the Austin heel turn a year later is roughly doing the same numbers as PG era Cena did. And I think the other thing, so like the alienation of the fan base. They saw this. They saw heel Austin, and were like, "So there's heel Austin. There's a bunch of WCW jobbers running around. This isn't '98, '99. This isn't as fun anymore. I'm just not going to watch." And then a, b- a bunch of people just lost interest. Maybe they'd still tune in, but they're not as interested. They're not as invested. They're not maybe buying the merchandise anymore. They're not tuning into every single Raw or SmackDown. They might watch SmackDown once every two weeks, like that sort of stuff. After what Austin did and how WWE booked this and O one going on, that's that's a lot of what happened. I've read this in you know dirt, I've read this in stories, sheet, dirt sheets, the like, like th- this sort of stuff happened. And then, yeah, I mean, I like the comparison to twenty eleven. Like they were doing good numbers in the build WrestleMania. So yeah, isn't that nuts? I mean, a lot of that's on the head of the Rock. Let me just see. Let me just throw in. Let's see what they were doing in June two thousand eleven, the summer of Punk. They were doing. It was down significantly. Yeah, they're doing three point two one. Yeah, correct. So the summer punk. The summer punk didn't draw ratings. That was the the, the big thing. What's um, What's crazy though is like, in May of two thousand two, they're doing three point seven on Raw. So hmm. punk's not too far off, you know. But no, if, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, a lot of that is punk. Just people not being able to look at him as a star. See, a punk kind of had the Cody Rose effect. Where it's just like a portion of the fan base is just not going to look at Cody as a star. Just is what it is. There's people that just keep be like, yeah, bro, that's Stardust. Yeah. Yeah, that's Dusty Rhodes, like, young son. Like, we just don't care, you know? And that's kind of with Punk. People are just like, oh, that's the guy that 
runs around shaving women's head and runs <laughs> around saying I'm straight edge and yeah it, it was just that effect but yeah I digress about <clears throat> it was I a, think there was a point in 02 I'm sorry I mean it's mean to cut you off yeah, there's a point okay. in 02 where they're doing 3.3 on raw hmm. and Smackdown was doing better numbers I mean this is like the Katie Vick time around that era around that that time frame and then SmackDown, yeah. you got like Eddie and Edge and Brock and Undertaker. SmackDown was just killing them. Well, Kevin, the wrestling boom by that point, you're talking like you're talking late kind of 2002. The the real boom is is over. Like that was the late nineties. That was like two thousand. But it ended but at WrestleMania was, seventeen. That was the end of the boom. Yeah, seventeen was like the the climax of what everyone knew and loved for years. With v- Vince lines. McMahon and Stone Cold shaking hands killed wrestling. Yes. That absolutely That's killed wrestling insane. forever. That was it. There's people that from that night, what was it, April 2nd? April 1st, 2001. April 1st, 2001. There's people from that night that stopped watching wrestling when Vince shook Austin's hand and have not watched a single second of wrestling since then. Oh, there's a lot of people. I, I, would, mm-hmm. I would venture to guess. There's a lot of people that have that, that, that thought. Yeah. No, Which, I, isn't that crazy? Like, that's got to be the biggest what if in wrestling history. Just like, what if on the next night, Austin just is like, hey, I got you, Vince. Or in the or that same night, shakes his hand and then stuns him. That's a big what if. Like, I know. that would yeah. have extended the wrestling boom period, don't you think? Yeah. And then as I alluded to before, you do that, Austin's still this big star. And then you do a really well done like WCW invasion with all the big names from WCW and like Eric Bischoff's leading it. And it actually makes sense and it's well put together. Like that, that extends the, the sort of boom for another year, maybe two. And ratings don't do what you just listed there, where they're, they're getting low threes with Katie Vick and Triple H. Like just, you know. It, the downfall began, but as we allude to, WrestleMania 19 was a, a definite plus that happened in 03. That was a, a great, all-time great show, which made the most of the talent involved. So hats off to WWE there. But as far as the interest from general fans, Austin shaking hands with Vince killed a lot of it, just generally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be like, I'm trying to think of a good equivalent in like a real sports comparison. Hmm. Like, w- would it be like if... LeBron, if like he never went back to Cleveland and he just stayed in Miami, would that have killed the NBA? If he just stayed in Miami for like the next for the past like decade, it wouldn't have been beneficial. No, it'd be the same thing as if they had Cody Rhodes walk into WrestleMania this year and just beat Roman in like five minutes, and then that that just ends the whole bloodline. It's like what? <laughs> Sorry, like you, you you didn't just spend two three you know, two, three years building this all up just for that. Like, if that happened this year, I'd be, I'd be disgusted. Yeah. I'd be sickened at that. So, you know, I'd lose a lot of interest. I wouldn't be tuning into my shows. I'd be barely paying attention. Similar sort of thing, but obviously quite different given the, the grandeur of WrestleMania 17. So, yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. Either one, either show, if you think WrestleMania 17 is better, if you think 19 is better, both are so good, but both are so flawed. And and I, I think people, I think people on Twitter would say that like Triple H and Booker T, like that's absolutely disgusting. But like that Vincent Shane feud from Seventeen is like kind of on the same level. Like both shows have just that infamous match that WWE can never refer to or reference ever again. That's just like in the heart of the show. And then you have the really bad ending of Brock nearly killing himself, and then you have Vince shaking Austin's hand. Or also shaking Vince's hand, however you want to word it. Yeah. Really interesting when you think about it. Well, I mean, I don't know the logistics of this because, I mean, I haven't studied this with Brock, but do you reckon that ending cost Brock several years of his prime or him wanting to continue in wrestling? Like that led him down a spiral of, you know, like Brock talked about this in documentaries where he left wrestling literally a year later. Like, <clears throat> like Brock was, what, 26? at yeah. that time roughly mm-hmm. like brock should have been for 10 years the big star but that happened and that potentially could have well took five to ten years off of his what could have been apex we got the ruthless aggression era 
in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, you got Brock being like a dominant beast, great storylines, great content. But he spiked himself on his head in the main event of WrestleMania 19, which could have ruined that. There's so many what ifs with these endings. The WrestleMania 17 ending damn near ruined any in interest and investment in the product for years. And the WrestleMania 19 ending took years off Brock's prime. Like, it's just it's fascinating. It is. But he left more so because he hated traveling and yeah. hated, like, just hating being on the road, what, yeah. five days a week. He wanted, then he wanted to try football. And just be like, oh yeah, I can just go play football. You know, I can do that. I'm Brock Lesnar. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Then it didn't work. And then he just goes on to become like the greatest mixed martial artist ever. <laughs> like one of the yeah. 10 greatest ever. And become the biggest draw before Connor and Ronda Rousey. It's nuts. I mean, the dude could do whatever. Like, I don't know if him spiking, getting spiked at his head was like the catalyst that drove him away. Maybe yeah. it was. Maybe it was because Vince McMahon wanted him to wrestle Goldberg. And he was like, you know what? I'm out, pal. Mm. Maybe. Nevertheless, pal, anything else you want to say in closing? Uh, pal, I'm going to ask this question, which mm. this could extend the podcast about 10 minutes, but Kevin, in your opinion, can we agree WrestleMania 17 and 19 in whichever order are the two greatest WrestleManias of all time? Yes, we could definitely wholeheartedly agree. Like These are the two holy grails of WrestleMania. If you're making a Mount Rushmore of WrestleManias, these two are gonna be on my list no matter what and the other two what spots what else, what else are the other two spots that's the question i don't know the other two spots are open for debate i mean if, if i'm over here not really thinking about it too much yeah i i'd probably go hmm i'd probably go 22 maybe i don't know right i don't know it's not really a trendy pick um mm. I, i'd go i'd have three and 24 Mm, 24 that's interesting um i, I definitely think, wrestlemania 3 is definitely on there wrestlemania 3 is definitely on there in the consideration yeah. 24 personal, that's interesting yeah. personal but, but it was, yeah to me wrestlemania 3 is in the top three just for more yeah. so significance with the main event and mm. just the stuff on that steamboat savage the significance of the main event and then the rest of the show is kind of a lot of it's there but just those two things alone. A personally, just a personal bias one. I'm putting 28 on my Mount Rushmore just because of you know kind of significance to me as a kid getting into wrestling. Cena, Rock, End of an Era, Punk, Jericho, all those are incredible. And that was like two two plus hours of the show. I love that one. That's just me. Not saying you have to put it in as your top four, but I loved it. So yeah, I, I think 24 was like I mean Kevin the only roster was stacked. Pal, did you know that? Oh, absolutely, pal. Stacked. Yeah. yeah, I think I would... I don't know. I, I think I might go WrestleMania 21. That's a good pick as well. That's a good pick 21 well. is just... That's another one where you could watch it. But uh, uh, either way, the point being, what I was saying is 17 yeah. and 19, they're on a different level. They're on a different planet in a different galaxy. They are near perfect. They're diamonds out of all the WrestleManias. Yeah, They're a 10 out of 10, both shows, in my mind. All the other WrestleManias... They just, they're on a different level beneath 17 and 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 21 is a good one to put on there. 22, um, 24, I don't know. I don't know if I can come around on that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of bad, and I was there live, so I have a different yeah. perspective. There's a lot of bad on that show, you know? Like, you got Cena, Triple H, and Orton having a triple threat match, like, for what? And Randy Orton just wins, like, okay, cool. Um, Floyd Mayweather versus The Big Show was an absolute spectacle. Yep. I, can't, I can't put that one into words. Um, Sean versus Flair, one of the greatest matches I've ever seen. The best match I've ever seen live in person, by far. That's really, I think, what what would put this WrestleMania in that in that next tier, whatever that next tier is. Because you, yep. you already got the all time classic match. Um. You know, Jeff Hardy, because he couldn't stop doing coke, didn't get to win the money in the bank. I, I think that would have helped the show if Jeff Hardy had won instead of, like, a CM Punk that nobody could take serious. Like, I literally remember, like, I remember being a kid sitting there in my chair watching this show. CM Punk grabs the briefcase, he's celebrating, and literally this guy looks to me, he's like, do you know who that guy is? <laughs> he's like, he's just like, oh, you're a kid, you must know everything, you have nothing better to do, you're watching this stuff every day, and I was like... I was like, yeah, that's CM Punk. And he's like, who? 
Uh, and that guy's winning money in the bank? Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. And it, like, I, I bought a t-shirt, too, because there was like people on the streets selling t-shirts, WrestleMania t-shirts. Jeff Hardy was literally on the t-shirt. <coughs> I was so excited to see Jeff Hardy. I had no idea he was suspended. It was That's different. Like, like, I didn't have access to like all these dirt sheets that 12-year-olds now have. Yep. You know, on your phone or whatever. I was like, oh, why is it Jeff Hardy here? Like, I, I was so disappointed. Yeah, that's Jeff that's Hardy, cool. pal. Never meet your heroes, pal. Oh, my gosh. Was there one other thing <laughs> I will say? Go ahead. WrestleMania 30, not being, like, a top couple all-time great WrestleMania. WWE, to me, WrestleMania 30 is the biggest ball drop of any WrestleMania, mm-hmm. or one of. The, the talent available, the product had momentum at that time. Mm-hmm. You could have put on an absolute all-time great dream card with who was there. And they gave us what they did. And it was, it kept, it's just disgraceful. I don't know where you put 30. This, this is a whole different thing. But to me, it's between like 10 and 20 all time somewhere. It should have been a Mount Rushmore WrestleMania. But WWE fumbled the bag, fell over, slipped on a banana <laughs> peel, made a joke of it. I don't know, Kevin. So yeah, that's I, me. Yeah. I, I think 30 is still in there somewhere in the top 10. Top 10, 12, I would say. Well, I just want to say about WrestleMania 21 real quick. State my case why this is a Mount Rushmore WrestleMania. You got Eddie and Ray. You got Eddie and Ray, the second greatest opening match in WrestleMania history behind Bret and Owen. You got Kurt and Sean. Then you have Triple H Batista in the main event. You have Cena and JBL in the upper card, um, the upper mid card. <coughs> Taker got, and Orton. Yeah, you got Taker and Orton. You know, you got the crowning of the two faces of the Ruthless Aggression era in one night. Unlike anything we've seen, I don't think there's ever been a, a moment like that where two big stars were created, two big, massive mainstream stars were created in one night like that. <laughs> and then, yeah, you have all the undercard stuff. Baker Orton, Sean Angle, Eddie Ray. Just a, it's an all-time great WrestleMania. Yeah, I, yeah I, 21 is definitely top five, I think, to me. Um, I, I think, yeah, the only blips, the Aki Bono and Big Show sumo match, that's a bit of an L. Yeah, it's a bathroom um, yeah. break. Every WrestleMania needs a bathroom break. Well, no, they. I mean, still, what, what what was the bathroom break at WrestleMania nineteen, pal? Undertaker versus Ten Lord Tensai. Oh my god! With Nathan pal, Jones. Only, pal, that was only like twenty minutes in. Your bladder must have not been that full. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no, then, I mean like the cat fight girls. That was the the bathroom break for some why people. Why you going to the? I mean, you going to the bathroom for different reasons during that. Like it's not <laughs> it's like. like <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Then we had the inaugural Money in the Bank ladder match, too. Don't forget that. I know, right. 21. Yeah, that is an all-timer was... card, bro. That's an all-timer Pal. card. We talk about the burial. How Booker T won a random interpromotional pre-show battle royal at WrestleMania 21. If Triple H hadn't have beaten him at WrestleMania 19, he would have actually been on the main show. Oh, my God. Are we allowed... <laughs> Jesus. Are we allowed to say that WrestleMania 20 is in this conversation? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's disqualified it's yeah just, it's, it's disqualified it, it, 20 is like it, it's like the athlete who like won an award but you find out they were doing drugs it's like oh so we're not gonna call yeah, it's, it's like barry bonds but... it's like the barry bonds of uh of wrestling all, all the baseball fans will get that reference <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let, it, yeah. let me just look at like some of the card on 20 real quick you got seen in big show with, for the, the U.S. title opening the show, this was the apex of Cena love. Cena's getting just standing ovation in Madison Square Garden. It's completely surreal to go back and watch. It. Like if you weren't watching at that time, and you grew up on like Cena getting hated by forty year old men, and you went back and watched Cena Big Show from this WrestleMania, you'd be like, "What? Like why are they cheering him?" Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Christian versus Jericho, whatever. It was a good mid card match. Uh, Goldberg versus Brock Lesnar. This match changed the wrestling business. In yep. its entirety. You know, Eddie versus Kurt Angle, Undertaker versus Kane, the main event with uh, Triple H and Shawn Michaels, Triple H forfeiting the belt at the end of the show to vacant. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. You know, overall a pretty good card. But I think I think if <laughs> obviously hindsight here, if, if the Benoit thing doesn't happen, or if, you know, they have an ending where say Sean has a big moment because God knows he's Mr. WrestleMania. He deserves one or two other WrestleMania moments. If like Sean won or something, and it's just it's an epic moment as well, we can look back on this and go, "Wow!" Like you know, but instead, yeah, the, 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 there's massive stain on this show, but 
it was a fun event. It was a great event. So. Oh yeah. All right, pal. Well, you're right. You just extended the podcast by ten minutes. So, nevertheless, I'm ready to get out of here. Uh, I think we've gone for like over three hours. So. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk to you guys on the next one. Hopefully, if you made it this far, uh, give us something. Give us a review. Share this. Send this link to your friend, your girlfriend, your mom, whoever. And yeah, we'll talk to you on the next one. Peace. Peace.